Good evening. This is the February 11th, 2021 meeting of the St. Mary's County Board of Appeals. We're located in the Commissioners of St. Mary's County meeting room of the Chesapeake Building, 41770 Baldred Street, Leonardtown, Maryland. I'm Dan Eknieowski, the chairman of the board, and we have the other members, four members that are with us tonight, so that we have met the requirements for a quorum and we will proceed with the meeting. Due to the Board of Appeals meeting not being open to the public currently, applicants and or their representatives are participating through teleconference on WebEx. This meeting can be viewed on channel 95 or the county's YouTube channel. Also, the public may listen to the meeting on their phones but not speak to the board by calling the following number, 1-301-579-1111. Seven two three six, and then use the access code nine six three four four three, followed by the pound sign. If any member of the public would like to participate by talking to the board during the public testimony portion of the meeting, please call the following number: three zero one four seven five four two zero zero, extension one two three four. When you call this number, Ms. Sherry Young, Recording Secretary, will ask your name, address, phone number, and email. In other words, this will be a virtual sign-in sheet. Ms. Young will place you in line on hold after I announce that I'm opening the hearing up for public testimony. I, I will open the meeting to public testimony after the presentations and testimony by the applicants and representatives have been completed. When you are taken off hold, you will be asked to state your name and address for the record. I will swear you in, and you will have three minutes to ask your questions or make comments directly to the board. Your comments will be recorded and heard by those of us in the Chesapeake Building, on WebEx, and on Channel 95 and YouTube. After the public comment portion of the meeting is over, the case will return to the board for discussion and decision. And now I'd like to have our Board of Appeals members introduce themselves, starting on my right. Good evening, Wayne Medinsky. Lynn Delahaye. And again, I'm Dan Eknieowski. John Brown. And the alternate member is Guy Bradley, and we believe He's on. And we believe he is online, so he's following us uh, virtually with, through the web ends. St. Mary's County supporting staff is also in attendance tonight, um, and they are the Director of Land Use and Growth Management, Bill Hunt, Harry Knight, the Deputy Director, and Stacy Clements, Planner 3. Adjoining in the joining meeting, media control room is Amy Carter, St. Mary's County video media producer, and in the adjoining Savage Conference Room, we have phone calls to the board are being held by, are handled by Sherry Young, um, who is the recording secretary to the Board of Appeals. Also on WebEx is Neil Murphy, St. Mary's County Deputy County Director. Our first case to Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Um, the board's attorney did not get introduced. I'm sorry, excuse me. <laughs> Steve, <laughs> okay. Steve, Steve Scott is our, is our attorney and sitting to my left. Thank you. Um, sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> um, we have three public hearings tonight on the agenda. The first case one is VAAP 2020-39, Ballard Property. The second case is VAAP 2012-09, Trajina property, is that correct? And the third case is continued from the January 14th Board of Appeals meeting, ZAAP 201746, Town Creek Marina, and Burkhart Appeal. Before we start the hearing, for viewers at home, you will be able to see the staff and applicants' presentations on Channel 95 or YouTube. These presentations are being as these presentations are being shown. You can also see the documents that have been submitted for this case by going to board docs. 
Ms. Clements will now demonstrate how to locate and use board docks. Okay. Share. There we go. Let me pull up St. Mary's County. Okay. You go to the stmarysmd.com, and at the top ribbon here, you want to go to board docs. It takes a moment to load up. Okay. We find the Board of Appeals meeting right here in the middle for today's date. We view the agenda in the center panel. And on the right hand side is the agenda for tonight's meeting. Ballard's right here. And under the Ballard or the agenda item for Ballard, you can see the exhibits one, two, and three, and all their attachments. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we will now begin our first case, um, the Ballard property. And what I would like to do first is have the staff make the presentation for us and give us the uh, items that are, and before we do that, we're gonna have them sworn in. So if those that'll be participating would stand. Please stand and raise your right hand. Do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. I do. Thank I you. do. And <laughs> we did the, we did the, the <laughs> uh, very good, okay. We got the Ballards done also. Yes. <laughs> Stacy. Okay, let's see. I'm gonna share content. Give me just a moment to pick up the Ballard. Okay, and I want to view, let's see, yeah. where's the slideshow? I'll show you. Mm -hmm. There we go, there we go, For some reason, <laughs> okay, tonight's public hearing. Um, for February 11, 2021, is VAPP or VAAP 20 2039, the Ballard property. They are asking for a variance from section 71.8.3 of the St. Mary's County Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance to disturb the critical area buffer to replace an existing wood retaining wall. The legal ad was printed in the Southern Maryland News on January 22nd and 29 of 2021, and the applicant posted the property and sent notifications to all the neighbors within a 200 foot radius um, prior to the deadline of January 27th, 2021. The owner of the property is Robert and Cynthia Ballard. The location is 21901 Helen Lane, located in Leonardtown. Um, they are a part of development um, of Mulberry South, a cluster of development number three of Mulberry South, lot one. Their land use is rural residential and their zoning is residential neighborhood conservation and they, they have an RC over, RCA overlay. Acreage of the um, property is 23,895 square feet. They have an existing house with decks and a patio. They wish to replace a failing, retaining, uh, failing wood retaining wall with a stone wall that running parallel to the existing retaining wall, um, but is closer to tidal wetlands and waters. 
the Health Department, the St. Mary's Soil Conservation, the Department of Land Use and Growth Management have all approved the site plan. The Critical Area Commission commented on this project on January 11, 2021, and the permit was amended according to their <clears throat> request. Okay, and here's the property located just outside of Leonardtown, um, adjacent to the Britain Bay. Okay, and here's our zoning map. They are in the Residential Neighborhood Conservation, or RNC. They are um, within an RNC neighborhood, but they're also adjoining the RPD. And this is the critical area map. They're in the resource conservation. The red um, line shows where the critical area buffer is. It is impacted and extended um, because of the tidal wetlands in the orange there that are adjacent to their property. Okay, here's um, a, a site plan. We've got the existing wall right along here and they wish to replace it with one a little bit further out along their property line. I've got a close up on the next slide that gives a little bit more detail. The yellow one is the existing retaining wood retaining wall. They wish to remove that and they want to replace it with a stone retaining wall. Okay. The existing wood retaining wall is currently failing. They would like to um, place the stone retaining wall in and then remove the um, existing wooden retaining wall after everything has been stabilized. Here is a detail of the retaining wall. And another detail showing you um, the stone. Okay. The mitigation for critical area would be 144 square feet of permanent <coughs> disturbance, 100 in, or excuse me, 1,187 square feet of temporary disturbance to remove the wooden retaining wall, uh, for a total mitigation of 1,331 square feet of mitigation. Um, mitigation plan for a site uh, on-site buffer planting must be approved to, by Lugum prior to the issuance of a building permit. Standards for granting the variance in the critical area. Before the critical area variance may be granted, the Board of Appeals must find the following. <clears throat> that special conditions or circumstances exist that are particular, peculiar to the land or structures involved and that a strict enforcement of the critical area provisions of this ordinance would result in unwarranted hardship. That the strict interpretation of the critical area provisions of this ordinance will deprive the applicant of rights commonly enjoyed by others in similar areas within the critical area of St. Mary's County. C, the granting of the variance will not confer upon the applicant any special privilege that would be denied by the critical area provisions of this ordinance to other lands or structures within the critical area of St. Mary's County. And D, the variance request is not based upon conditions or circumstances that are a result of the actions of the applicant. And E, the granting of the variance will not adversely affect the water quality or adversely impact fish, wildlife, or plant habitat within the critical area, and that the granting of the variance will be in harmony with the general spirit and intent of the critical area program. And F, the variance is the minimum necessary to achieve a reasonable use of land or structures. Does anyone have any questions? I, I've got a comment. Okay. Could you go back to this picture, please, of the wall? Yes. There you go. Thank you. There's a letter from the National Resources Planner that states that the, the new wall should be in the same position as that wall, rather than the two feet out that they're asking for. What she says is, 
in this same location. You can imagine tearing that wall down. What do you do with that dirt and stuff? Put the new wall up. It's, it's not a good recommendation. It should not be considered. I agree, Mr. Richardson. Um, Lugum staff um, agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, it would actually put the stability of the house and the soil behind the existing wall at greater risk to remove what holds it in place at this time and then wait for the new wall to be constructed and become stable enough to hold all that back. What if there was a torrential rain? I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's not, I would say that comment was written by someone who doesn't understand the construction risks of not having the new wall in place prior to removing the existing. Thank you. So we'll dis disregard that statement. Yeah, because I, I was going to ask the same question because you didn't bring it out in your discussion, but but I think so that the critical area commission doesn't think we're blindly kind of telling them to uh, go their own way. Uh, at least we brought out the reason why uh, we're supporting it being in front instead of in the same location. Yes, including, um, and so that was a recommendation from the Critical Area Commission. Well, yeah, and um, I just want to, basically we're saying no, it's a dumb recommendation, and this is the reason why. Yeah, and the, and the Critical Area Commission also recommended removing the spa, and so the, the applicant very much met them halfway. They eliminated the spa, but, are, um, but for good reasons are keeping the wall where proposed. That's no longer part of the permit. No, sir. Or the, spot. Right. The variance hearing tonight is only for the retaining wall. Okay. Okay. Now, All right. Thank you. Somewhere in the package, it was saying that the spa was a no-no anyway. I don't know if it was or wasn't. Um, it is in the staff report. The um, um, spas are defined. My question is, it sort of alluded that a spa was equivalent to a swimming pool and any spa I've been in, I play hell. I think I could do a lap immediately because it's only about five or six feet long, okay? So I was trying to say, where did this definition of spa equals pool come from? Well, it came from the St. Mary's County Zoning Ordinance, which is currently in effect as um, you know, a regulation binding citizens in St. Mary's County. Um, it, it was entered into the ordinance through the normal public hearing process. It was fully vetted and adopted. And so while um, you may say a spa is not a pool, the adopted regulations of St. Mary's County define a, a swimming pool includes a spa. Okay, I just wanna know what the point of reference was. Will, will a building permit have to be obtained for the construction of the new wall? Yes, sir. And it will have to be inspected by the um, building inspector. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Some for the applicants whenever. Okay. Um, I, think, I think we're there now. So, uh, Mr. Ballard, Cindy Ballard. Um, this is Anita Sullivan. And, okay, and I'm sorry, the third person was Anita Sullivan, and all three of you were sworn in as we yes. did earlier. And then what about Mr. Jeff Flick? Mr. Flick? He was on the phone. Yes. I hope we lost him. We lost him? There he is. Yes, sir. Um, okay. Um, could I swear you in, then, go, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Flick, can I swear you in? I guess since you're on the phone, we can't see you, but do you declare and affirm under the penalty yes, of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ballard, uh, go ahead and proceed. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, everybody being here tonight and making this all technology work. Um, so we built this uh, house in 1999, um, and we've lived here uh, ever since. With uh, with the wall, um, with the the yard being a, a fairly steep slope, we wanted to put a retaining wall, and we got a permit about 2002, I believe it was. And then um, we built that wall ourselves, basically. Um, it worked fine for a long time and until about two years ago. I think the, the pipes that were behind it that caused the water to drain away got clogged up and got a little more hydrostatic pressure behind it and it started to slope outward as you see in the exhibits. 
So we've, uh, we hired um, Jeff Flick uh, of Stepping Stones Incorporated to come out and, and see if he could do anything with it. So we've, um, over several different iterations, we've tried to brace that wall up with timbers and some uh, concrete footers and some stone, blue stone type things. He dug out the entire behind it and put drainage pipes in it. And that helped uh, stabilize it quite a bit, but it's uh, it's definitely not going to last a whole lot longer in its current condition. Uh, so we uh, started the uh, application process to get a permit. We did want to put a spa back there on top of the patio, um, but we were advised that that would probably not be wise to do. So we backed off of that. Like Harry Mike just said, we've kind of met halfway, and we feel like that um, this is a pretty reasonable request. So we just wanted um, basically replaced it with a verde block system that's a uh, jeff tells me can hold up to 1750 pounds of pressure per block which would be significantly stronger than uh, the wall that's there now backfill it put some gravel and some um some shrubs on top of it and it'll be a nice uh, addition to the house make sure that it's, it's not like we're asking for a lot of extra room in the backyard that we don't need it we just wish to stabilize the property and the dock association owns the, the, the land that's right in front of our uh, house it's about a three foot wide strip before you get to the marsh and uh, it's just um, the way that it was laid out when before we moved here and they uh, they came down and inspected it we told them the process we were going to go through and they have no problem at all they in fact they said they'll, they'll give you a, a letter in writing and I think it's already on the board of uh, information that you have available and they uh, they said that's for this board of directors and any permanent or forward um, future board of directors from the Moultbury Dock Association that they won't oppose us um, constructing a wall adjacent to the open area, what's called open area E. And that's what we plan to do. We're going to stage our materials in our yard on the top of a tarp, and some of the materials will be on top of the existing patio. So there shouldn't be any materials or anything besides a little bit of um, digging in, in what we consider the uh, Critical area. That's all I have to say. Do you want to add anything? Either? The small area they will extend for construction to keep the existing wall in place while the new wall is constructed is still on their property. So they're not encroaching into the Dock Association property. They will abut it, but they won't encroach into the other property. So everything will remain on their property. And the wall is made out of a permeable material. So as far as drainage and filtration, it is safer and more um, environmentally friendly. OK, thank you all very much. The board have any questions? How, how tall is the existing wall? Oh, the existing wall? Probably about seven feet at this high support. It's seven feet tall. It's about that, yeah. It, I dug those pole, I dug those pilings down about four feet into concrete, but they still uh, it still started to move a little bit um, in the last few years. The exposed part of the wall, I would say, you know, five feet or five to seven feet. I, I could go out and measure it if you want me to. <laughs> no. Um, how far in front of that will the uh, new wall have to be? Um, well, Jeff says he needs to dig about a three foot wide uh, trench. And Jeff, if you're on the phone, you could just tell him what you need to do there. He's gonna be sworn. Yeah, it's approximately a three foot trench. Um, we typically like to bury at least one course of block below that. Uh, but from where the line shows where the new wall will be, uh, that's the extent of the excavation. How far in front of the existing wall is the footings? Anita, do you have that to scale? I believe it's approximately two feet. Yes. Uh, might be 30. It's roughly two feet. And, and does this new wall, does it, uh, I've seen the only picture I've seen is the one you posted. Does this actually step in uh, each time with each course of block? I believe the detail showed that, yes. Yeah, well, I'm, we don't, I don't think we have any of that. Do you want to bring up that detail? Um, PowerPoint? That's correct, yeah. It's approximately one inch uh, 
every course that it goes up. <coughs> mm -hmm. See how it cants backwards? Right. But I'm, we don't have that with, I wish we did. Mm -hmm. We don't have that with that packet. It's okay. It should have been included with the package. Yeah, I would like to see it. And they're, they're, yes. They are interlocking blocks also. Yeah, I can I can tell by the uh, the uh, the other ones you had. Not by this. You can't tell by this. I can't get it. The rest of the board like to see this, or is that something oh, that's got, not in our package? You or? Got, no. well, it is in our package. It's in there. It, it, it's it, in it our package. Part of attachment five. I okay. I mean, I, it's already as part of the submission. It is definitely part of the. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I think this would commonly be referred to as a pre-engineered. Retaining wall. Any other questions from the board? No. Um, I guess, do we have anybody on the phone? I could. Oh, you, well, if you're announcing now that it's open to the public. It's open to the public. Okay. <clears throat> and we want to repeat you, you give it, give what we have here okay. as soon as I find it. The board will now open the hearing to, for public testimony. To repeat, if you want to phone in and make comments, please call 301-475-4200, extension 1234. Ask, do we have anybody? Okay. All right, we'll give it a minute and see if yep. anyone calls in. Yeah. Give it a minute. <laughs> you could go ahead. Board of Appeals. Ms. Young, do we have any callers for the Ballard property? We do not have any callers at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, in that particular case, then, I believe we will close the public hearing portion and go to the board for any discussion. Questions, comments? My, my first thing is uh, I understand where the uh, um, critical area commission is coming on this, but once you find out that it's seven foot tall, there's no way that that dirt's going to stay there. Right. And, and like Mr. Knight said, if there is a storm, it would be uh, bad. So uh, I don't have any problem with this. Somebody want to make a motion? I'll do it. In the matter of VAAP number 20-2039, having made a finding that the standards for granting a variance and the objectives of section 24.3 and section 24.4 of the St. Mary's Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance have been met, I move to approve the variance request from section 71.8.3 of the St. Mary's County Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance to disturb the critical area buffer to replace a wood retaining wall. Second. I'd like to add to that two feet outward of the current wall. You want to make that a condition? Um, you want to show the illustration again? No, I can. Yeah, I think their site plan clearly shows that the actual distance in front of the existing wall varies a little because they're, I think, don't bring it up. You, you, you are, you are you correct. Go. Yes, there's yeah. a. Yeah. Oh, go back to that one. We yeah, yeah. just were. And perhaps that's, you know, so that the, the new retaining wall has a more um, straight line. So, so would it be more appropriate to say approximately two feet? Or as per shown on the or per submitted shown site on plan? the drawing. Okay. Okay, that would be good. Thank you. And I'll second it. Any question? Discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. 
An order reflecting the board's decision will be paired by staff and signed by the board within 60 days, Mr. Ballard. Yes, a 30 day sir. period follows from the date of the order is signed during which during which time any aggrieved party may appeal the board's decision to the circuit court. Any action taken during that time must be at your own risk. The recording secretary will mail you a copy of the order when it is signed. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Our second case tonight is the Trujina property, VAAP 20-1209. And uh, again, staff has been sworn in, so we'll let you go forward with the presentation as to what we're here for. Okay. Switch over real quick. Let's see. It's having. Okay. There we go. There you go. Let's go back a slide or two. You need a and there we are. Okay. For our second hearing tonight for St. Mary's County Board of Appeals for February 11th. 2021, we have VAAP 20-1209, the Trajina property. They're asking for a variance from section 32.3.2 of the St. Mary's County Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance for a reduction of the mandatory setback from buffers and from section 71.8.3 to disturb the critical area buffer to construct a house addition with an area way. The legal ad was printed in the local newspaper, Southern Maryland um, News, on January 22nd and 29th of this year. The applicant posted the property and sent notifications within 200 feet prior to the deadline of January 27th, 2021. The property owners are Raymond and Carol Trajina. The property is located at 22865 Grampton Road in Clements. The land use is rural preservation. The zoning is rural preservation district and the critical area overlay is resource conservation area. The property consists of 1.85 acres and it has an existing house with a shed and patio. They are proposing to add a 552 square foot addition to the house with a 47, 47 square feet area way. The Health Department, St. Mary's County Soil Conservation District, the Department of Land Use and Growth Management have all approved the plan. The Critical Area Commission commented on this project on August 12, 2020. The uh, project is located just outside of Clements, near Bushwood, just off St. Clements Bay. It is located in the Rural Preservation, and all the adjoining properties are also Rural Preservation District. Uh, the critical area is the resource conservation. Um, as you can see, the tidal wetlands um, impeded on the west side of the property also, which <coughs> encroaches into the house area. This is a copy of the site plan. The critical area buffer is here. Uh, St. Clements Bay is right here. And the existing house is right here. I've got a detail um, that'll show it a little bit better. Next slide. Okay, this shows the setback um, variances. Okay, we've got the bay right here. We've got wetlands right in here. And the existing house along with the proposed addition. The critical area buffer is located right along this line. And 20 feet off that is where the setback should be for the rear setback 
I was. So, okay. yeah, so what's unique about this case <clears throat> is the, if the um, existing house is in the 100 foot buffer, and what renders it non-conforming, because we have a lot of houses in the 100 foot buffer, but they're smaller lots. This lot, um, the red triangle she showed, is a building envelope large enough outside the critical area buffer that would allow this house to exist. That's what makes this a non-conforming mm -hmm. structure. It does not conform to today's zoning setbacks. I just wanted to clarify that. That's why this is um, a zoning setback variance as well as a critical area buffer variance. Just a technicality. But do you see the red triangle? <clears throat> That's the allowable building envelope where the house could sit with no variances required. And the house was built in? The house was built in the 1980s. The original house was actually um, permitted. It's an interesting history. Mm -hmm. The original house was actually permitted just before the critical area regulations took place, uh, took effect. So its location in the buffer is grandfathered. Um, but because they're asking for development today, we have to apply today's setbacks. And when you have a property that has that much um, buildable area outside the sensitive area, <clears throat> it is non-conforming to those setbacks. And so so it would start to not be a variance for the expansion of the non-conforming use. If the expansion of the non-conforming use was only up to 25%, the director could approve it. If the expansion of the non-conforming use was up to 50%, this board could approve it. But this expansion is over 50%, hence you have to grant a variance. Thank you. Okay. okay. I'm not sure what I'm looking, I guess on your site plan, and you have, a, you have what I think is the existing building with the stairs. Uh, and then you have a red line going around. Is that what they're proposing? Yeah, that yeah. there. Yeah, I'll continue the. Oh, okay. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm <laughs> the sorry. presentation. Uh, this might make it a little bit more understandable. Tell me to be quiet. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the red line is the limit of disturbance. Disturbance. Yes. This, the stairs you see is the area way right to the there. lower level. Um, the existing houses to the right, um, kind of ghostly. They often draw the proposed improvement more prominent and the existing, they, they leave a little faded. Uh, Mr. Knight, on that same page, it says the existing 12 and a half story frame. What's 12 and a half story? Oh, I'm sorry, that must be a typo. <laughs> yeah. What, what's, a square, what's a square foot? Oh, I foot? see exactly what you're saying. Yeah, so I, I have, I mean, Mr. Hunt, who, whose firm drew that, will be able to explain, but you know, is it one and a half or is it two and a half? It's definitely not 12 and a half. <laughs> that, if that was the case, it would have non-conforming <coughs> height as well. <laughs> so well, what's the square footage of the ground floor? I mean, we realize it's a small house, but how small is it? Uh, I, I think we say in the this staff report. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna try to pull it up over here. Find it in the brief. The, um, yeah, it looks like the addition is 599 square feet. Yes. And the, um, it looks like the existing is a, a little bit more than that. The actual living space, just to give you an idea of what they're doing, because it is a two-story addition, that's not relevant to the critical area portion of the variance, but um, it is relevant to the expansion of the existing structure part. So um, the existing house is 1,850 square feet of living space. The proposed addition is 1,379 square feet of living space. Um, so that's both store. Well, what's, what's, what's the square footage on, on the ground level? Of, we agree it's a small of house. Of the existing right? house. I'm, I'm gonna estimate about 900 but square feet. We, we agree it's a very small house. It, yeah. Pulling up it's, as it's, it's certainly not a large house. Thank you. Not until you add the 12 and a half stories, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, size is relative, how big the family is <laughs> and what you're used to, I would say. Okay. Let's All right, see. back to the presentation. Back to the presentation. Okay. There we go. Um, the black line here is the critical area buffer. 
Everything on the southern portion of this is within the critical area, including the house and the patio. Um, the addition, everything in yellow is inside the critical area. The little blue triangle is outside of the critical area buffer. Okay. Where's the walkway? They, you said it was a walkway? Or? The proposed walkway is yeah. to the left. What, where the stairs are? Yes, that's the area way, yes. Okay. I think it's an access to the lower floor? It's to the lower level, correct. Okay. Yeah, um, from grade stairs down. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Let's see. Mitigation. We have 1,797 square feet of permanent disturbance at three to one. We've got 700, or 700, 571 square feet of temporary disturbance for a total of 2,368 square feet of mitigation. A mitigation plan will be um, approved by land use and growth management prior to the issuance of a building permit. Okay, standards for granting variances. Um, except as provided in sections 24.3 and 24.4 and 24.5, the Board of Appeals shall not vary the regulations of this ordinance unless it makes a finding based upon evidence presented to it that, one, because of particular or a per particular physical surroundings such as an exceptional narrowness, shallowness, size, shape, or to topographical conditions of the property involved, strict enforcement of this ordinance will result in a practical difficulty. Number two, the conditions created by this difficult, the difficulty are not applicable generally to the properties within the same zoning classification. And three, the purpose of the variance is not based exclusively upon reasons of conveyan, or convenience, profit, or caprice. It is understood that any development necessary increases property that any development necessary increases property value and that alone shall not constitute an exclusive finding. Number four, the alleged difficulty has not been created by the property owner or the owner's predecessors in title. And five, the granting of the variance will not be detrimental to the public welfare or injurious to other properties or to the improvements of the improvements in the neighborhood and the character of the district will not be changed by the variance. And six, the proposed variance will not substantially increase the congestion of public streets or increase the danger of fire or endanger the public safety or substantially diminish or impair property values within the neighborhood. And seven, the variance complies as nearly as possible with all the spirit, intent, and purpose of a comprehensive plan. Would you like me to go over the standards for granting the variance in the critical area again? That was a no from the chairman. Okay. <laughs> no, no. Okay. No. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Ms. Clements, would you just, if you're not going to review them again, just cite the, the section in the Comprehensive oh, Zoning okay. Ordinance. Um, just for the record. Question. Let's see. Is it, would that be section 24.4? Yes. Tw okay. It's section 24.4 of the St. Mary's County Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Okay, um, for the Trajinas, who will be making the presentation? Okay, I'm trying to stop sharing. I will. I, who is I? Wayne Hunt, I'm sorry. <laughs> With little silence is rest. Okay, and are the uh, Trajinas gonna testify also? They are here to testify if need be, so they should be sworn in. Okay, so if, if you three would stand and raise your hand. And do you declare and affirm under the penalty or per of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may be you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yeah. 
And the Trigena is Yeah, I think Mr. and Mrs. Trigena may be muted. We did not hear you. Mr. and Mrs. Tur Mrs. Targina, would you unmute and say I do, please? Or stick your thumbs up. I've done that before. There should be a little red microphone. There, there you go. go. I do. Thank you. I do. Good. And Mr. as well. And Mr. Trigina? Mr. Trigina, Mr. Trigina, could you say I do? I do. Very good, sir. There we go. <laughs> Mr. Hunt, carry on. Yes. Good, and you? All right. I have a brief presentation. I can get it started. <laughs> Do you see my presentation on the board? No, sir. Nope. You need to go up into your WebEx, up into the ribbon, press the share button. And I hit share and then screen, she... or let me do it that way, the PowerPoint presentation. There we go. There it is. Um, what are you seeing? Is it clear or because I, I can't see what you're seeing? Um, that is well sized and um, and you've got the, the windows open on the left. OK, so it's not in presentation mode, but I'm not going to push my luck. OK. <laughs> um, so uh, once again, Board of Appeals presentation for 22865 Brampton Road quick overview of the St. Mary's County or of St. Mary's County just to give you a feel of where it is in relationship to the rest of the county. Facts map view showing its location and you can see that it is fairly isolated. There's quite a bit of distance between the Jardinas and their neighbors. Um, this is just an old survey. It shows you, I mean, this was surveyed in 1957, which well predates the uh, creation of the critical area regulations that we're seeking a variance from today. Some quick photos of the site, just an aerial to show you the character of the site. Um, the boundary line that's shown here, of course, isn't correct, but we do have the fields in the back and a majority of the site is forested. Um, front of the house, I apologize, this doesn't give all the character of the house, but it does show you some of what's going on. This would be the side of the house closest to the water. And this is the other side of the house where they're proposing the addition. One thing while I've got this open that I would like to point out to you is you see there is a current areaway or steps into the basement. This is the only access that the Chiginas have to their basement area. This uh, addition is going to remedy that. And it's part of the reason for the addition and part of the reason for the size of the addition is that they needed room to accommodate a new set of stairs for access to their basement. Um, this is the rear of the house. Doesn't show very well, but uh, you can see that it's not a full basement when we're talking the size of the basement. This area over here to the left in the white that has the windows is a full basement. The area to the white that is a, unex or a unpainted brick, you can see the vent, it's more of a crawl space. So the expansion of the basement is, is not full. Um, just a view from the pier, the house, and finally, the site plan that we were looking at earlier, just a full size for reference. Um, some things I want to bring to your attention is that yes, we are going to be exceeding what is allowed by the ordinance, or we're asking to exceed what's allowed by ordinance as far as the size of this addition. But as it was noted earlier, and I think you realize is that this is not a very large house. Um, this expansion is for a second bedroom. That tells you the size of the existing house. It is also, as the Turginas age, it's giving them an opportunity to create a bathroom and a living area that will help them to age in place and it will be more accessible to them and easier for them to live in the house. Um, 
Mr. Chagin, as you've seen, has owned this lot for a very long time. He purchased it, he said, right before he went into the military and uh, came back later and decided to build his home on it. Everything predates the ordinance. He's, um, in my opinion, not asking for a lot. Um, he's waited a long time to uh, put this addition onto his house. Um, not sure what else I can add to that. If there's any questions at this point, I'd be happy to answer them. The addition is that also going to be a basement, or is it just? Yes, all? it is. So you're going to. And currently, they don't have any plans on finishing it. The plans I've seen are an unfinished basement at this point. So you're going to add on to the basement part. I, yes, sir. I, I need you to walk me through that. I see where the. Um, access door is so you're going to add on to that side and and then it wraps around the back of the house so it's a straight extension from the side of the house that you from see that on side. my screen now and then it wraps yes, around sir, the back. which is or not no it, it's straight out it does not wrap around the back right it is a straight extension and it is also an extension away from the water i might add it, it's they're, a, they're expanding the side that's going to push it away, furthest away from the water. It's, it's a square immediately abutting a rectangle. Okay. But the access is going to be in a different spot? Uh, it's actually just moving with the... <clears throat> that's the current, and it's moving out here to the addition. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, and another story on top of the basement, just like the existing house. Yes. Okay. Mr. Hunt, could you resolve Sorry. the 12 and a half story frame house with basement item? I was hoping nobody saw that. I was reviewing this as I was going through and I saw that and I, I just had to shake my head. The intent was one and a half story since it's not a full basement. Okay, so the two goes. The two goes, I believe the two is supposed to be a dash. I considered whiting it out, but I did not want to alter the applicant's exhibit. <laughs> I really wish you would have to save me some embar embarrassment, Mr. Knight, but uh, it is what it is. Any other questions from the board? No. no sir. Can somebody tell me how to stop sharing? In oh, can you go? Uh, let's see. Um, if you hover at the top of the... Um, Menu bar. I see it now. There's a, yeah. There's a stop. I got it. Yes. There we go. There we go. Okay. The board. Now, you're, now you're an expert. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> you're proficient. Fairly handy with Zoom, learning WebEx. The board will now open the hearing up for public testimony. To repeat, if you want to phone in and make comments, please call 301 475 Four two zero zero extension one two three four. I'm going to give it a moment so if anybody wants to call in, they have a chance to dial in. Young, do we have any callers for the Georgina property? We do not have any callers at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That will close the public hearing portion of our meeting. And do the commissioners have any comments? I have no questions, sir. Questions? I think it's a very reasonable request. I, I, I do, too. Um, really good. Yeah. The only only thing from the uh, critical area commission was the uh, mitigation. Absolutely. And yep. that that's going to be on site. I believe so. Okay. Yeah, I don't I don't have any problem with this. So. In that case, we'll take uh, well take needed. A, take a motion. I'll make a motion. 
In the matter of VAAP number 20-1209, having made a finding that the standards for granting a variance and the objectives of section 24.3 and section 24.4 of the St. Mary's County Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance have been met, I move to approve the variance request from section 32.3.2 for a reduction of the mandatory setback from sensitive areas in section 71.8.3 to disturb the critical area buffer to construct a house addition with an area way. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passed, five zero. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, an order reflecting the board's decision will be prepared by staff and signed by the board within 60 days. A 30-day period follows from that date the order is signed, during which time any aggrieved party may appeal the board's decision to the circuit court. Any action taken during that time must be at your own risk. The recording secretary will mail you a copy of the order when it is signed. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item is the Town Creek Marina uh, Burkhart appeal. And I think before that, we ought to take a 10 minute break. Okay. Perfect. Put this on mute.
Hello, everyone. There we go. <laughs> okay, I'd like to call the meeting back to order. And again, this is a continued meeting from the January 14th, 2021 Board of Appeals meeting, ZAAP 2017 Town Creek Marina, Burkhart appeal of the director's decision. Um, if I remember correctly, what we have done is we have had a staff presentation explaining the situation. The appellant has given their presentation and their, through their attorney, uh, Chris Longmore. Land use and growth management had a response for, with the testimony from Mr. Harry Knight, and that's where I believe we ended the meeting. I believe at this point in time, it might be appropriate to say if Mr. Longmore had any questions of Mr. Knight as a rebuttal or, or his follow-up. Mr. Longmore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I think that is where we're at, and I believe um, Mr. Knight's available in the room. Is that correct? Uh, that correct. is correct, and he has been sworn in this evening. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Knight. How are you today? Good, and yourself, Mr. Longmore? Good, thanks. Good. Um, I, I just have some follow-up questions from where Mr. Murphy left off um, at the last hearing. And some of this might be repetitive. If it is, I apologize. Since it's been about a month, I, I wasn't sure if some of these background things came out. But uh, I guess, first of all, how when did you get involved in this case or in this, this application? How, how long have you been reviewing it or, or assisting the county in it? I recall um, some emails from, uh, you know, memory serves me, around June. Okay. So, so, is, is, so that's June of this past year, 2020? That is correct. Okay. So you weren't involved with any of the um, prior review of this site by Mr. Uh, Mahaffey, you know, in the letter that we had in, in 2014. Uh, you were not part of the review team at that point, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, and the decision, I'm going to share my screen just so, uh, again, we can um, review some of these things together. Let me, here we go. Perfect. So, so Mr. Knight, I'm just pulling some of the, uh, the, the items that are already in the record from board docs, just to, again, since it's been a month and, and we haven't uh, been looking at this more recently. Um, this this email that's before you is one of the versions of the action that this appeal is, appeal is based on, correct? That is correct. Okay. And the uh, um, first portion of the, the disapproval by Director Hunt relates to the, the property that we had looked at before that is in the um, RM district. And there was one structure that encroached somewhat into a 10 yard side yard or 10 foot side yard setback. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And I, I believe you testified earlier that that was not a significant issue and may have been able to be worked out if that was the only one, but because uh, you didn't want to give, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but I want to make sure I understood correctly. Uh, the position of staff was not to give comments back to the applicant to correct that because overall you, you didn't think um, the proposed units would be allowed given the, the second reason for denial. Is that a fair statement? Yes, the, um, the communication to Mr. Hat Mahaffey in multiple emails had already made it clear that the department felt that this was clearly a single marine site, which was only allowed one single family dwelling per commercial marine site per the footnote on um, schedule 32.1 and the um therefore it was my understanding from the very beginning when he made his development review application that the whole purpose was to give him a written final disapproval from the director of land use growth management so that mr burkhardt could file an appeal Okay. So, and so I it's a fair to leave, yeah, oh, I didn't want to leave anything out. I just wanted it to be a, a, a flat out disapproval. Okay. So so is it fair to say that if the only issue in the plan were this ten yard ten foot side yard setback, that there probably would not have been a disapproval, but instead there would be some working with the applicant to see if that could be resolved 
through well, a variance or, or, or some other? Well, technically it would have been disapproved, but the comment would, would have probably been more friendly, like returned for revisions, but it certainly okay. would not have been approved. Okay, okay. So, so the real significant issue, would you agree with me tonight, is the, the interpretation of, of the word site uh, based on the definition in chapter 90 and how it applies to this application? I think that's a reasonable perspective. Okay, and and what's showing on um, the screen now uh, that begins with two three nine zero zero North Patuxent Beach Road, um, that that is the section that cited the disapproval based on that definition. Is that correct? Yes, that is the um, property um, zoned commercial marine. Okay, and um, I'm gonna again for the I, I guess for the boards. Uh, purposes and for us, I'm going to share a different screen now, if I can, just to make sure that it's clear what the site was that you were um, looking at. Excuse me, Mr. Longworth. Yes. Can you tell us what exhibit and attachment that is, please? The exhibit that I was that I was just discussing with Mr. Knight is Exhibit Three, Attachment Seven. It is one of the attachments to the staff uh, um, presentation or the county presentation. Thank you. Now, is my is PowerPoint now showing uh, to the? Uh, can, can you see the PowerPoint slide I that I have up? Okay. And this is for the board's um, edification. This is the PowerPoint presentation that I used at the last hearing. Uh, that was up on board docs, but also has some drawing on it that I did as I questioned Mr. Mahaffey. And, and Mr. Knight, again, just to, to remind the board or make sure we're all on the same page, um, is it correct that the site that is referenced in the director's decision is the, the portion to the right that is enclosed in red here, roughly? Yeah, with the obvious um, marina use, the um, piers. Right. That wrap around the internal basin and the large um, commercial building. Okay. So all of that is, is considered the site that was part of the decision to the best of your knowledge? That is the CM site. Okay. Now, can you share with the board what is it about this property that made it a site within the meaning of, of Chapter 90? How did you and, and the director determine that this was a site? I um, would say it's the director who determined it was a site, so I would actually leave that to his testimony. You're you appealing the director's decision, yeah. not mine. No, I understand. You testified quite a bit about it before when Mr. Murphy was questioning you. Do you believe this is one site? Absolutely. Why? Because my director interpreted it as such. And uh, when I read the definition in the zoning ordinance, I believe it meets the definition of a site. And it is a um, property that is zoned commercial marine. And the issue at hand is, can they have multiple dwelling units on the commercial marine zone? And footnote, um, and the base density allowance in the commercial marine is none, capital N-O-N-E. And um, however, there is <coughs> four that allows one single family dwelling in um, per, per commercial marine site. Right. And, and so this site is six different lots and really a portion of, a, of another lot, correct? That's not relevant. Um, that um, that fits, wasn't my question. Is this? That fits uh, with the uh, definition of site. Mr. Knight, I'd ask you to listen to my questions and please try to answer what I, what I ask, not what you, why you think I'm asking it. Okay. My, my question was, does this site consist of at least six different lots of record? Yes, it does. Okay. And you had said that you believe it's a site and that it falls within the definition of site as shown in Chapter 90 of the CZO, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And what, just so I'm clear, I'm not sure that I understood your answer. What about this set of lots, in your opinion, makes this a site within that definition? Um, I think if you read the definition, what you are presenting before us conforms to that definition as a site. 
Okay, let me let me try to do it this way then, because I'm uh, uh, respectfully. I think that was. I understand your answer, I, I believe, but I'm going to show you another exhibit, and maybe this will allow me to be clear on what I'm asking. I apologize, Mr. Chairman. I'm trying to, to share a different screen that's taken a second. So, Mr. Knight, can you see the, the Exhibit 3, Attachment 9 that I'm, I'm showing you? Yes, sir. Okay, and this, this is the definition from Chapter 90 of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance that you just referenced, correct? That you referenced. But that is, that is okay. the definition of site from the zoning ordinance. Okay, I believe, uh, I'm not trying to play word games with you. I know you nor am I. But the, the one item and the one thing about this that is different is that the the underlines are not in the ordinance, correct? That was that is correct. I believe that was added maybe by the county attorney in preparing the exhibits or by staff. But but the words in here are the the definition of the term site, correct? That is the def that, that is the definition of a site taken from um, chapter ninety of this comprehensive zoning ordinance. Okay, and I believe a moment ago you said you believe that this uh, property consisting of the six lots is a site because it meets this definition. Can you can you point to the board what language in this definition led you to that conclusion? Well, again, it's the director's conclusion, but I think anyone who reads the, these words can see that a site is defined as any track lot or parcel of land or combination of track slots. We know these are recorded lots. We could just focus on those words. So any combination of lots, which are in one ownership, which is a true statement in this case, they are contiguous. Um, and the development to be formed, to be performed was submitted as a single unit, a single project as shown on a single application. I am inserting the word single three times there. Okay. But okay, it is so, an so, description of the facts of what brought us to this appeal today. Okay. Okay, now, um, I, I believe you, and you did testify, you weren't involved, the 2014 letter that you discussed with Mr. Murphy last time, you were not involved with the review of the, the site at all. Um, during that time period. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and I'm showing on the screen now a copy of that letter that's in board docs as exhibit four, attachment two. Can mm -hmm. you see that? I um, do. And, and there is a, in the first paragraph of that exhibit that, that I believe is now showing, it states that several of, and this was a letter from then director Phil Shire to Mr. Mahaffey, correct? That is correct. And it said that several of my staff and I met with Ren Siri, director of the Maryland Critical Area Commission, and two of his environmental planners on May 15, 2014. Do you see that? I do. So it's in, just to confirm, you said you hadn't worked on the project before. Is it a safe assumption that you were not at that meeting um, in 2014? That is very true. Okay. And and this letter is copied. Do you know who was at that meeting? Um, it's pretty safe to say the people who were courtesy copied. Okay. And, and is that the list that's showing? Can you see that on your screen now? And I can see that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, are, are all those individuals uh, either former or current land use and growth management employees? All former. Okay. Okay, but they were at the time of this letter, to the best of your knowledge? I think that is an accurate statement. Okay. Um, in your prior testimony, you indicated that the applicant did not honor the lot lines or that some of the proposed buildings crossed the lot lines. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, can you, I, I'm showing the, the, the drawing that was submitted by Mr. Mahaffey that gave rise to the appeal now, um, which for the 
Um, and I apologize to the board. I don't know which exhibit number this is, but it is one of the exhibits in board docs. I believe um, it is attachment 11 of exhibit three, um, if I'm looking at the index correctly. Um, and, and Mr. Knight, I see the lot lines on this exhibit. Which lot line do you think is being infringed upon by, by one of these proposed buildings? Or how many? Which ones, or if there's more than one? I am not having as much success discerning the lot lines on this small laptop. Um, but it does appear that um, the proposed house on lot 12 crosses the um, right-hand property line. The proposed house on lot 11 does the same. The proposed house on lot 10 does the same. And what, what, what is, why do you think that? Because it, <laughs> and I'll share with you that Mr. Mahaffey will testify in rebuttal that that certainly was not the intention and that the intention is that they be placed on the lot line, um, but not that they encroach over it. Well, Mr. Um, Walmart, not because I think that, it's because I see that. Okay, so so, how critical is that to your belief that this is a whole site, that the, that the buildings cross a lot line? You know, Mr. Murphy discussed that quite a bit. How important do you believe that was to the director's determination, or or your opinion of this matter? Um, the director's determination. Um, it's um, it. Um, if he wants to be able to encroach on those property lines without adjusting the property lines or building firewalls as the um, zoning ordinance can um, can require when buildings um, are built on a property line, the solution to that is to invoke the definition of site. It's a very common practice. Um, we have a lot of old subdivisions, and this is an old subdivision, where the lots are small and the proposed development in order to fit will have to encroach on property lines and even cross property lines. And I see these buildings crossing the property lines. Okay. Well, again, Mr. Mahaffey will testify that the intention is not that these cross the lines, even though if it appears to you that they do. Oh, I'm dead. But okay. If they do, what was the significance what was that, Mr. Murphy? Oh, I was saying objection. You were you were testifying as to what he would testify. I just would, well, uh, would testify. I, I, yeah, I would just say wait well, for uh, Mr. Mahaffey to testify. I, I'm happy to recall Mr. Knight after I do my rebuttal, Mr. Murphy, or we can just keep it moving tonight. All right, whatever. Um, so, so, and Mr. Knight, I bring this up just because you and Mr. Murphy brought it up last time. What, what was the important to, to this appeal uh, that was raised last time that you believe some of these were were crossing the property lines? I'm not, um, I don't know that I would say that I made it important, but I. But if you want to talk about it, I see them crossing the property lines. Okay. If either this is redrawn clear so they do not cross the property lines, would does that, that have some significance to you as far as this appeal? and the issues that are before the board. I don't think I, it again. changes. I do not think it changes um, my prior testimony minutes ago where we went through the definition of site and this still meets the definition of site. Okay. So is it fair to say then whether the buildings are on the lot lines or slightly over or slightly on the inside really has no bearing on whether this is a site or not? I would agree. Okay. It, there, uh, Mr. Could, Mur there could be no buildings proposed on the single application, and it would still be a site. Uh, and, and I appreciate you clarifying that. I only ask again because it was raised by the county and, and its questions to you last time. So I, I saw it as being irrelevant. I just wanted to make sure you agreed. Um, the the next question that there is also some questions asked to you. But Mr. Longmore, about, I think you put a word in my mouth. I did not say it was irrelevant. I simply said I wouldn't classify it as myself characterizing it as important. I did not say it was irrelevant. Okay, how is it relevant to whether this is a site or not then? 
Well, we've already discussed that if you want to cross lot lines, an easy way to do that without having to adjust the lot lines is to take advantage of the definition of site. Okay, and I'm really not trying to play tricks on you. I'm well, just asking, fine, but, but why is that relevant that to this I appeal? found it irrelevant what? like you did, and that's not what I said. I did not say it was irrelevant. Well, how is it relevant to the determination of whether these six lots are a site or not? It's just relevant to the discussion of what the definition of site allows you to do within the parameters of the zoning ordinance. Right, but that wasn't my, my on question. Your... That, that wasn't my question, Mr. Knight. If it, and I'm not trying to play tricks. I'm just asking you to answer my questions. Mm -hmm. How is whether one of the buildings is over a lot line or not relevant to the issue we're here tonight to talk about as to whether these six lots are one site that would only allow one single family dwelling? Um, I don't think... Um... I mean, what makes it relevant to the discussion tonight is because it's on the exhibit. It's part of the application. It was a single application requesting multiple houses. That's what makes it relevant. Okay. But it wasn't raised in the director's decision, correct? Uh, you have the director's decision in writing. I won't try to characterize it differently. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, now, Mr. Murphy also asked you about side yard setbacks. Do you remember that? Uh, not precisely, but if you want to talk about them, I'm fair game. Well, I believe Mr. Murphy raised questions about whether the proposed buildings, including the five buildings on the CM property that we can see here, um, I believe it was those, and maybe the, the sixth one that's lower to the right. Mr. Murphy had asked you about whether it would violate the side yard setbacks. Um, do you remember him asking that a month ago? Um, not not precisely, but if you want to ask it now, I'll answer it. So is whether or not these are, do you believe that these do violate any side yard setbacks as drawn? It's obvious they do. Okay. And what relevance would that have to whether these six lots are one site or not? The, or, or does it have any relevance to that? Uh, um, if you want to um, violate the minimum side yard setback, as this application shows it intends to, it needs to take advantage of the definition of site to allow that encroachment. I understand that, Mr. Knight, but how does it relate to the question of whether these six lots are one site or not? Mr. Longmore, that was my answer to that question. I'm sorry if my answers don't turn out to be the words you're um, hoping for. Well, no, I just don't think you answered my question respectfully. I think I did. So, but isn't it true with side yard setbacks that you can reduce them to zero if certain conditions are met? Yes. Yeah, we've discussed that already. This well, I don't think we did. I was referencing I section think I 61. Did I mentioned the points. fact that zoning ordinance can require a firewall. Right. But, and I just want to clarify for the board because I don't think we talked about this that section 61.743 allows for a side yard setback to be reduced to zero if those conditions are met, correct? That is correct. Okay. So if these buildings were intended to be located right on the property lines, it doesn't necessarily violate anything. It's just that the applicant would need to meet the criteria of 61.7 in order for them to be allowable under the ordinance, correct? Well, they they are in violation until they satisfy that section, and that section requires a recorded document. Okay. But to the best of your knowledge, did the fact that these drawings appeared to be either over the lot line or over a setback have any bearing on whether these six lots are one site in relation to the director's determination? Again, I'm not going to um, try to tell you why the director made his determination. I think it's appropriate to ask him that. Okay. I'll ask him that. I just, you had testified with Mr. Murphy before, so that's why I was asking you. Um, I believe when Mr. Murphy uh, questioned you before, uh, he had asked you a question about the one acre size reference in Schedule 32.1. Do you remember that? I do. Okay. And I, I believe, and I just wanted to clarify, Again, since it's been a month, I believe 
you indicated that that would be relevant if this were a new subdivision, but you, it, it was not important to the question we're here discussing tonight. Is that a fair statement? I would not classify it as important. Okay. And then um, Mr. Murphy also asked you about the title that was listed on the application that came to your office. Um, and that title, and I believe I might have that up, um, and I'm showing it on the screen. Uh, Mr. Murphy asked you about project name being Sissel Subdivision Number Four of Patuxent Beach. Do you see that? I do. Okay, and I believe you indicated that you didn't find the project name to be relevant uh, to what we're talking about, and that you said it could have been called Burkhardt's, uh, you know, houses or something else. It's it fair to say that that but what the title of the project is doesn't really have a relevance to what we're here discussing tonight. Yes, I I don't think um, you you can name it. You know, he could rename it. it. It's names are not important. Okay. And one other thing that you mentioned last time was that do you recall we looked at the the table of some other uses that are allowed here and the the bed and breakfast use um, came up. Do you remember that part of the discussion? Yes. And I believe you indicated. And I want to make sure I understood you. Were you indicating that the applicant could build a, a, a different bed and breakfast on each of the six lots that are zoned CM in this project? Absolutely not. Okay, so so maybe I misunderstood you. What what were what were you saying there? That there could be a bed and breakfast, and a bed and breakfast can be comprised of multiple buildings. Okay. And that um, would conform with the comprehensive zoning ordinance, and that would conform with the comprehensive plan, and that would conform with the purpose clause of the CM zoning. Okay, and, and when you say you can build multiple use of the land to get the property on it. And what portion of the zoning ordinance are you referring to um, for mining the board's edification that you can build multiple buildings for a bed and breakfast? That's the um, use standards for bed and breakfast. Okay, and that's use number 55? I'll, I'll take your word for it. I do not have it before me. Okay, let me, um, here, let me see if I can uh, offer some help on that. <clears throat> if I may just have a moment um, so that we can all look at the ordinance together. Yeah, I'm sorry, I meant to bring mine up. I had it tabbed. No, that's fine. I know we're doing this remotely, so it's a more difficult than normal. It'll just take me a moment. I, I apologize just, yeah. to the board. You can bring it up. That, that will save me from having to hold it in front of the camera. And I'm just trying to... Okay, there we are. So it's lodging. Is my screen being sh shared now with the zoning ordinance? I can uh, see it. Okay. And and this is, uh, I believe we're discussing, this is use number 55, correct? Lodging, bed and breakfast in? That is correct. Okay. And where in here does it say that it could build? Uh, uh, what was your my understanding of why you believe there could be different buildings for one bed and breakfast? Uh, I, I I don't, I, I'm really not trying to mischaracterize what you said. I'm, I'm yeah. trying to remember what you said on it. Yeah. Well, I, you know, when I'm reading it here, I might have misspoken. It, um, the number of guest units shall not be more than six in any single structure or more than 10 on a parcel. Well, if there's only allowed to be six in a single structure, but I'm allowed to have 10 guest units on a structure, uh, or on a parcel, parcel you mean? and that means I can have at least two structures, one with six and one with four. I could theoretically have one with six and four with one. Okay. But that's on a parcel, right? Not on a site. Um, that is the word parcel. That is true. Okay. But um, so, so what in this definition would not allow a separate bed and breakfast on each lot. What would not allow a separate bed and breakfast on this lot? 
um, based on, on, each, the, on each lot. On each lot. What in this section would not allow that? Um, the, um, the fact that when they, sub, well, again, the purpose of the appeal tonight is that what is before us on, if we want to talk theoretical development of this property, what would prevent one bed and breakfast on each lot is he would not be able to provide sanitation on each lot. Well, now, and that, if I know you're getting in other you're, areas. Unless you're proposing to develop it as a single site where they share a single septic. Well, in that, if that was happening, how would that affect how many bed and breakfasts could go on each lot? Um, I, you know, I'm not the director. I can't give you a formal interpretation, okay. but my take on this is that um, the word parcel here would re, um, be referring to the commercial marine site. Even though the language doesn't say that. Well, again, I'm not in a position to give you an official interpretation. Okay. And if a bed and breakfast. Also, Mr. Longer, them... I, would, I would tell you, I'm, I always find it extremely uncomfortable when tr people try to seek a review um, off the cuff on the fly. I think it's only appropriate um, when you want staff to review things in accordance with the ordinance that a formal application be made and they give be given the opportunity to sit back and thoroughly um, review the application before them against the words of the ordinance and if necessary, seek guidance from the director. Well, and, and Mr. Knight, I'm not trying to trick you on that. The, the idea of putting bed and breakfast structures on there came up during your testimony last time. And, my, and what, I meant, how... my, what I meant in my testimony is a single bed and breakfast, multiple structures on the commercial marine site. Okay. And do you see this section B, and that would be a new structure, correct? Yes. So each of them would have to have the appearance of a single family dwelling, correct? Yes. Okay. My point being, he basically gets to build what he's proposing, only he has to use it differently. So he could, is it, and that's, uh, and maybe that clarifies. Use so, of the land. So, and, and that might clarify my question. So you said he could essentially build what he's proposing. Does that mean the number of structures he's proposing? Um, potentially, right? Because we already discussed that he could have one structure with um, six guest units in it and four structures, one each, comprising the total 10 per parcel, if you'll allow me. Okay. So you could have the same number of structures that all look like single family residences, but it, because of the definition that the director has adopted of a site, he cannot build the same structures that they're used as single family dwellings. The definition that, that St. Mary's County commissioners adopted of site through the public hearing process, well vetted and, and is regulation. I, I understand how you interpret it and we interpret it different we, and reasonable people can do that. But, but that is, if I understand you correctly, not to let my question get lost in your answer, you believe it's possible that they might be able to build all six structures that look just like single family residences, as long as they're used as bed and breakfasts. That's my recommendation. Okay. Okay. Now, um, to the best of your, and I know you mentioned that the standard was adopted, you know, in the ordinance after proper vetting and adopted by the county commissioners. To the best of your knowledge, has this definition ever been applied to another? applicant uh, in this type of setting, or is this kind of the first time you've seen it apply? I've seen the um, definition of site um, applied in many different settings. Okay, let me be more specific then. With a commercial marine property where an applicant was trying to propose 
one dwelling unit on multiple lots? Have you ever seen it applied in that type of setting before? Or is this the first time this issue has come up? No, this, is the, second time, like this, this is the second time this issue has come up on this very same property. In 2014, the director of land use growth management at the time, no. Bill Shire, made it very clear in writing that the commercial marine property as a site is only entitled to one single family dwelling. That director okay, made well, that decision and this director made that decision. And Mr. Knight, just so I'm clear, when you say Mr. Shire made that clear decision, are you referring to the 2014 letter that's in the record? Yes, I am. Okay. So other than this site, has this ever been applied to commercial marine property before like this? I'm not trying to trick you. I'm no, just asking if this is the first you, site. But I can't give you a um, all-encompassing affirmative answer because I don't have that body of knowledge in my head. Right. All right. That's why I asked you to the best of your knowledge. Have you ever seen this applied to any other commercial marine site? Um, I, I do believe, yes, that we um, had a commercial marine site um, ask about redeveloping because they um, wanted to um, have multiple dwelling units. And that's actually, I believe, the case that brought up that, oh, look at that. The residential density allowed in the commercial marine is none. And back then, we didn't even have footnote four available. And yet they already had a house. And that so it was part of the catalyst to create footnote four. So that was before the current ordinance, not the language we're applying tonight, correct? It is. I think, um, I think that's you said it was before the footnote, right? Before the footnote. Because, so the without footnote is footnote, what says you can have one per site, right? Without the footnote, you'd have no single family dwellings in the commercial marine zone. Okay. And, and again, I, I don't want to argue with you. Have you ever seen the language of footnote, what is now footnote four, it used to be footnote 14. Have you ever seen that language applied to another commercial marine site? Or is this the first time it's really being tested or, or looked at to the best of your knowledge? Um. It's possible it's the first time. It's possible it's not the first time. So, but you don't have any knowledge of any other ones as you sit here tonight? I can't. I'm just asking um, your knowledge, not whether uh, yeah, anybody I know. else. You're testing my knowledge on the fly. You know, I'm an old man. I can't. I, I might recall on the drive home. Oh, that's the one I should have thought of. Sorry, Mr. Longmore. I'm not coming up with it at the precise moment. Okay, but you can't remember as you sit here tonight. Is that a fair statement? I think that's what I just said. Okay, I was just making sure I understood you. Um, now, let me ask you this. These are, there are at least six separate lots there, correct? Uh, I'll take your word that there's six. I, I, I don't know the precise number. There are current existing non-conforming residential lots um, created with a residential subdivision. Um, they, they are non-conforming and in a, um, zoning category that will not allow them to be used as independent residential lots. Okay, Mr. Knight, I'm going to try to ask real basic questions because I think you're answering a lot more than my questions, respectfully. I'm a talk Is it your understanding that there's at least six different lots on the commercial marine zone property we're here? This isn't a trick question. We talked about I don't about think it is, and I think my, even though my answer was long-winded, I think it was affirmative. Okay. So isn't it true that if the applicant wanted to, they could sell lot 11 right in the middle to somebody legally and they could sell that lot to a third party? Um, I'll take your word for it. I'm not, okay. you know, I'm not um, an expert on um, sale of property. Okay. If a third party owned one of these lots and came in to apply for one single family dwelling, would they be allowed to do so? Um, they'd be allowed to apply, and it would go through review. Okay. If, if all six of these lots were owned by different people, how would the definition of site apply to this to these six lots then? That would depend on the application before us at that time. Okay. If all six lots were owned by different people, and two lot owners came into the county at the same time and applied to build a single family dwelling on each of their lots, would that be allowable or would the definition of site prevent that? 
it would be allowable to make an application, it would be appropriate to give it a um, proper review, not a review on the stand, with all due respect. Well, you're saying that these six lots can only have one single family dwelling because they're one entire site, correct? Well, I did not say these six lots. I said one commercial marine site. And um, by definition, as we've already covered, these lots, combination, in single ownership, zoned commercial marine, are a site. Okay. The schedule in the zoning ordinance says that the residential density in the commercial marine zone is okay. none, N-O-N-E. However, lucky for um, a past applicant, we clarified that you can have one single family dwelling is permitted per site in the commercial marine zone. That is in conformance with the comprehensive plan. That is in conformance with the comprehensive zoning ordinance. So would this be one site if, were, uh, if different lots were owned by different people? The, the definition of site gets applied during um, application review. If it would be okay. more appropriate. I can ask Mr. Hunt when he's, uh, if you don't feel comfortable asking, answering it, I'm happy to ask Mr. Hunt. I'm Mr. comfortable Murphy answering it. Him. You're not comfortable with my answers. Well, I think it's relevant to this issue because my client owns six lots and we and believe client, that each of them has a right to have a, a unit on it. And I think I the interpretation I of the term site, we believe demonstrating that there could be multiple owners of these six lots, we but think that goes not. to the reasonableness there of are, the interpretation of it. There are not multiple but owners. I, There's a single application and by definition, it's a site in the commercial marine zone allowed to have one single family dwelling. Okay, uh, I'll be happy to discuss that with Mr. Hunt uh, when okay. he's up. All right. I think those are all the questions I have for Mr. Knight at this time. Thank you, Mr. Knight. You're welcome, sir. Do you have any questions? <laughs> I do, yes. Oh, actually, um, uh, Mr. Chair, I believe there's also redirect, so I get to ask, uh, just as Chris asked Mr. Mahaffey and Mr. Longmore asked Mr. Mahaffey questions after cross-examination, I believe I also get that opportunity. No, no objection, Mr. Chair. Okay, that'd be fine. Sure. So I'm going to uh, stop well, sharing my oh, actually, screen Chris, in case you, you need to. Oh, sure. Before we get <laughs> started, I need it up. I'll, I'll put it back up. Excuse me. Before okay. we get started, if I could ask Mr. Mahaffey to stand and we could swear him in. I, I believe he's going to ask questions to Mr. Knight, not Mr. Mahaffey, Mr. Chairman. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, continue. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Mr. Knight, you uh, we're looking at the screen right now of the sketch. Is that right? Yes. And on the commercial marine site, the property on the right, were the lot lines ignored? Um, the buildings crossed um, the lot lines. Were the setback, setback requirements followed? No, the buildings encroach into the minimum side yard setback. And you heard, I believe it was Mr. Uh, it may have been Mr. Longmore who stated that Mr. Mahaffey would testify that the intent was to have the houses fall on the lot lines. Do you remember Mr. Longmore saying that? I do. And can the developer invoke the definition of site to allow all of these things to happen copacetic with the CZO? Yes. I would say they can take advantage of the definition site. Sure. And do you think that's what happened here? Um. Just on, not based on your just in your in your position as deputy director. I would say that that is what happened here because as much emphasis has been raised about the side yard setback, these um, encroachments were not mentioned due to the application of the definition of site. And Mr. Longmore brought up the title of the project being Cecil Subdivision, and you said that you didn't necessarily think that the title was important. Do you remember that? I do. And you made you emphasized a lot in your testimony that uh, it mattered what was shown on the application. Do you remember saying that? Right, and when I say that, I don't mean the 
the title of the application. I mean, the um, of description of the proposed development and the site plan. So it could be called whatever, so long as it's whatever's followed on the application is what we look at, right? Yeah, honestly, I probably never even read the, um, the, the name they gave the project. And under, but under the definition of site, we look to see what's on the application, just to say that again, is that right? Correct. And we look to see whether a project is being, or whether development is being performed as part of a unit, subdivision, or project, and that's how the definition of site is met? Um, yes, that um, those terms are in the definition of site and they apply to this project. So if something is in common ownership, uh, and it's a number of lots, and it's being developed as either part of a project unit or subdivision, regardless of what the title is, it's a site, is that correct? Yes, sir. Is sharing septic important as to the definition of whether something is being developed as part of a unit project or subdivision? Uh, the single septic um, is part of the single unit. So, okay, thank you. And, and if it's, again, if it's being part, developed as part of a single unit, if it meets all the other conditions, it's then a site, is that correct? Yes. So he, you also mentioned that he could build the same structures and treat them as bed and breakfast. Do you remember saying that? He could request an application to be reviewed as a bed and breakfast, and he could build um, a um, similar quantity of structures. Could he also obtain the same number of uh, dwelling units, but on the RM property? Oh, absolutely. Could he actually obtain more dwelling units than he could on the CM property? Yes, he could have more dwelling units um, by building them on the um, on the RM property. You mentioned that you weren't entirely sure, maybe yes, maybe no, whether this definition of site has been invoked in the commercial marine district. Do you remember saying that? I said I actually, the more I thought about it, um, I believe it was a commercial marine project that um, where the word site and the um, density um, resulted in footnote four. Right, and let's also, let's just talk about the leverings, the neighborhood that this is going to be, or is proposed to be in. How many, are all of those, there are a number of commercial marine uh, zoned properties, is that correct? I believe there's five. How many of those have more than one single family dwelling per marina site? Uh, none to my knowledge. Including this one. This one only has one single-family dwelling. Is that correct? On this on this commercial marine site, that is correct. And do you know of any Mr. other commercial Knight, marine could you speak site? up a little more? Oh yeah, there is only one existing single-family dwelling at the at this time on this commercial marine site. And just in case the board did not hear, are there more than one commercial? Are there one more? Are there more than one single-family dwellings on any commercial marine sites in the Leverings? I don't believe so. Do you know of any in St. Mary's County? I, I'm not aware of any. So everyone has been just, everyone has built, as far as you know, only one single-family dwelling per marina site in St. Mary's County. Hmm. As I, far as you know. I, yeah, I can't say that there's any commercial marine sites in St. Mary's County. Um, with more than one single family dwell. Five times. And I'm going to, at this time, going to ask Mr. Longmore to stop sharing his screen because otherwise I can't share mine. Um, perfect. Thank you, Mr. Longmore. And at this time, I'm going to pull up just one slide on my PowerPoint. Okay, let's see. And then, sure. Thank you, Mr. Lamore. And then, screen. I think this works. Can everybody see what's a PowerPoint? Does this look like a PowerPoint? Oh, no, it's kind of big. Hmm. That's fine, I'll just keep it as this and zoom in. So I'm showing you what uh, we've looked at a number of times. It's Phil Shire's letter to Mr. Mahaffey from 2014. Um, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more so we can focus on the important language. So 
<clears throat> let's look at the first paragraph. The uh, so I guess the first big paragraph, the second line, and it says, or let's just read. Actually, just read the first full sentence from the top, from the beginning with several of my staff. Mr. Phil Shire wrote. Back in 2014, several of my staff and I met with Ren Siri, director of the Maryland Critical Area Commission, and two of his environmental planners on May 15, 2014, to discuss redevelopment of the Town Creek Marina site in parens, the quotation mark site. And although you weren't at that meeting and although you weren't privy to this, is the use of the word site important? I, I'm going to object to that. Mr. Knight said he didn't even work on this. How could he know whether it's important to Mr. Shire or not? Sure, sure. That, well, yeah. I would I would say that other people have been allowed to characterize their impression of this letter. And when I read the body of this letter, I think it is important in understanding what the letter said at the time and what it means today. I, I was simply stating I don't believe he can say what Mr. Shire meant when he wrote this letter because he didn't I have any involvement until I earlier was in uh, yeah, I, wasn't, I, wasn't character, I wasn't asking Mr. Knight to characterize what, uh, whether Mr. Shire thought something was important, only whether <laughs> Mr. Knight thought that, that was important. Mr. Chair, uh, uh, up, up to letter. you whether to allow, it, allow um, that. I will question. allow it. I think, I think these words, the site in parens, and where it's also um, mentioned in this letter is very important for anyone to accurately read this letter and understand the meaning of the letter, which is very clearly, and we move down, regulatory site constraints, 2A, CM District, footnote 14, schedule 32.1 of the Conference Zoning Ordinance, stipulates that one single family dwelling is permitted per site schedule 50.4.15 of the CZO notes that only a detached dwelling unit is permitted in the commercial marine district. The owner of the property did not take the opportunity to appeal that decision back in 2014. We are reaffirming that decision here in 2021 and giving them the opportunity to appeal. I'm going to ask you to reread the final sentence, the one beginning with Schedule 50.415. Do you mind reading that just one more time? Not at all. Schedule 50.4.15 of the CZO notes that only a detached dwelling unit is permitted in the CM district. Only a detached dwelling unit is permitted. Is that correct? That is correct. And he differentiates that because he mentioned seven dwellings in this in the top, right? He, he mentions that the um, redevelopment proposal was requesting seven dwellings. But as for the CM district, only a detached dwelling unit to, is permitted in the CM district. Is that right? That is correct. That is how the letter, letter reads. Nothing further. Okay. I don't have any further questions of Mr. Knight, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, next then I think we're back to Mr. Murphy and I think he has another witness, Mr. Hunt. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Mr. Hunt, if you would stand and raise your right hand, please. Do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, I'm going to share my screen. This time, I think I might actually get it right. Let's see. Application. Yeah. And from current slide. And can everybody see the PowerPoint where it has uh, the sketch on in front? Yes. Is that what's being shared? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Mr. Hunt, uh, you can scoot forward just in case they can't hear you. Um, and I got my COVID vaccine, so we're all we're all good. Um, so, I'd like I'd ask you first to introduce yourself to the board. They may they all know you, but just for the record. Certainly, William Blaine Hunt. I've been with St. Mary's County Land Use and Growth Management for eight years. 
started as deputy director and have been director here for about three years at this point. I came to St. Mary's County from Lake County, Illinois, where I had been in the planning department there for 10 years. And before that, I was 12 years in Ocala. And part of your responsibilities as, as director of the uh, land use and growth management is to interpret the sub or is to interpret the CZO. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And are you, you're familiar with this case. Is that right? I am. How did you become familiar with this case? There was discussion in the office about a proposal that Mr. Mahaffey was going to submit that was going to request more than one single family dwelling on a commercial marine site. And did you end up receiving an application as to uh, that particular project? Yes, we did get an application. And right now I'm showing you what's on the screen is part of that application. It's a sketch. Are you familiar with this sketch? Yes, I'm familiar with that sketch. So uh, let's take a look first at the left side property. And uh, Mr. Longmore went over with this with uh, Mr. Knight, but I'd like to go over with you again. Hey, so the left side property, the there was an issue with that. Is that correct? The RM zone property? The only issue that was found when that when this sketch was submitted was that one building setback line that's been discussed. Okay, and as we said, that could have been addressed by variance or comments or fixing it by, by itself. Is that correct? Sir. Sure. Um, and you only rejected it because, or rejected the project as a whole because an application was submitted for review. Is that right? And that application showed more than one single family dwelling on a CM zone property. All right, let, zone. Yeah, let's talk about that CM zone property. So that's the property on the right, is that correct? Yes. And they wanted six single family homes on this property. Is that right? They wanted five new ones. Uh -huh. And I believe the one that's furthest at the bottom is a single family dwelling that they were going to remove and rebuild as another single family dwelling. So you reviewed the application as a whole, is that correct? Correct. And you consulted with staff members? Yes. And that includes uh, Brandy Glenn and, and Harry Knight? Yes. And you read uh, Phil Shire's letter from 2014? Not at the time. Gotcha. And have, have you read it since then? Yes, I have. Oops, I don't know why it's has been so much. That's odd. So, Let's put that up. We just went over this with Mr. Uh, Knight, but you notice that it says uh, seven, well, the redevelopment would include seven dwellings. Is that correct? That's what I see. And Mr. Longmore pointed out that the words dwellings and footprints are used in different parts of the letter. Dwellings and footprints, plural. Do you remember that from last hearing? I don't remember footprints per se, but I know that we've discussed more than one dwelling. And at that time, five, uh, at the time of this particular application from 2014, five dwellings were to be put on the CM and two on the, what was then RL, is that right? Uh, let me read that part. If you remember. And that's if you don't, that's fine. It's not necessary. It's just that there were seven dwellings, is that right? Development. That's what it says, yes. Okay. Let's look at the regulatory and site constraints that we just went over. Uh, can you, well, it says one single family dwelling is permitted per site. Is that the same interpretation that you have? Or is that, where is that from actually? Let's start there. Objection, that's not an interpretation. That's a quote of the order. That's, that's right, that's what I, I was rephrasing. Where is that from? I'll allow it. Schedule. And if you can read the next line for me. For the schedule 50.4.15. Schedule 15.4.15 of the CZO notes that only a detached, detached dwelling unit is permitted in the CM district. Does that mean one detached dwelling unit per marina? A marina is allowed one single family dwelling, yes. Gotcha. So is your interpretation consistent with Mr. Shire's interpretation? Yes. And that is that only one single family dwelling can be permitted on a single marine site. Yes, that's my interpretation. Gotcha. 
And if you remember from last, uh, let's see, is this still showing? I think it is. If you remember from the last uh, last hearing, Mr. Longmore put up uh, this slide. Do you remember that? I do. And it shows 20 non-marine uses uh, in the CM. Is that right? It shows a lot of views. <laughs> it, sure, it sure does. And one of those is dwelling unit detached, obviously. And it's, it's the one that's bolded, or one, dwelling unit detached, detached sorry. Yes. And you and I, uh, how many marine uses are allowed in the CM, if you know? I believe if you count them, they're nine. Okay, so that's 29 total uses in the CM zone. Is that right, 20 plus nine? Well, there's actually a few more than that because Mr. Longmore didn't include the accessory uses that would be allowed in the CM zone as well. Okay, so there's more than, maybe more than 30 uses that can be made to this property. Uh, I'd have to take the time to count them. I don't know if it'd be that many or not. Okay, well, if there's 29 already, oh. there's, there's probably <laughs> at least 30, right? So he can build one single family home dwelling on the CM property, right? Correct. And then still use that property, the CM property, in at least 28 different ways, maybe, right? Maybe. The CZO allows more than one principal use per site, mm -hmm. but of course, the use has to be allowed in the zoning district to go on that site as a principal use. As a principal use, right. And you're also familiar with the comprehensive plan, is that right? Yes. And what is your role in interpreting the comprehensive plan? I have the authority to do that. Okay. And is your interpretation of one single family dwelling unit per marina, does that conform to the comprehensive plan? Yes, it does. I'm gonna put that up for the board. This is taken from comprehensive plan section 4.5.3. Uh, it's general land use concepts. And uh, is that correct? Are you, you yes. Okay. And let's go just to 4.5.3C, where it says marine use. Um, so it says marine use development in this land use category includes, and then it lists a bunch of things. Is that right? Right. Are, um, what's the last sentence say? Residential uses should be accessory to the marine use of the property. Can you say that again? Residential uses should be accessory to the marine use of the property. So although they're listed as a permitted use in the CZO, the comp plan requires them to be accessory to the marina. Is that right? That's the way I Objection. Hear. It's not a requirement. It's the comprehensive plan. What, what role does the comprehensive plan have in the CZO? The CZO is implemented, it is adopted to implement the comprehensive plan. So they're consistent, is that right? They have to be consistent. And does allowing, or does the accessory use of residential pro, or residential uses, does that conform with Harry's understanding or Harry's history of the uh, one house per marina is for the use of the marina operator? That would be consistent with how Mr. Knight explained how that came about. So and as uh, Mr. Mahaffey said, if I own a home in the CM, people using the marina can't just come into my house, right? I, I recall him saying that. I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly what that means, but I recall him saying something all day. Are these, as Mr., do you remember Mr. Mahaffey's testimony about uh, the uses of these property properties, the homes? Uh, Actually, I'll ask, I'll ask a more simple question. Are these single family dwellings accessory to the use of the marina? No. Do you remember him ever mentioning that they were? No, in, in fact, if we go to Mr. Mahaffey's letter, I believe that you'll see that he writes that waterfront property is uh, an economic use that would be desired for this for the houses that are proposed. So the principal use of those properties is for residential market. Is that right? Based on his letter? Based on his letter. So six single family homes in the commercial marine do not conform to the comp plan or the CZO. That's how I interpret it. And because you're only allowed one one home per marine site? Yes. And they propose six here? Correct. Okay. And do you still stand by your decision to deny this project? Yes. Nothing further. Mr. Longmore. 
thank you, Mr. Chairman. If um, Neil, do you mind stop sharing your oh, screen? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't catch that, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, no thank you. Um, Otherwise, I wouldn't have known. Yeah, good evening, Mr. Hunt. How are you? Fine, Mr. Long. We're nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you, too. Um, just to follow up on, on a question uh, or a few questions Mr. Murphy just asked you, um, I'm going to share my PowerPoint from last time, and it, it includes something that Mr. Murphy was just discussing with you. The These kind of marine use, class, you know, the non-marine use classifications that, that are allowed in the CM zone. Do you see that? Correct. I can see it. And um, you and Mr. Murphy were just discussing the comprehensive plan. Uh, you remember that part of your discussion? Yes. So if I if I own a lot, well, let me ask you this: Do all properties that are zoned CM have to have a marine use on them? No. Okay. So that means that if I own one lot in the CM, I could build one single family dwelling on it and still comply with the comprehensive plan, correct? No. You for the why not has to be accessory. And the comprehensive zoning ordinance doesn't say that, correct? Yes, in footnote to the now four it does. It says that a dwelling has to be accessory or that you can only have one dwelling per site. I'll show you the footnote. I'm not. Let me see if I can find that. I apologize. I know we have a copy of it here. But I can pull it up too, Chris, if you don't have it. Or if you can't find it quickly, I got it. Um. I don't mind since you helped me out with sure. Here it is. Here it is. No, here it is. Yeah, I got it. Thank you, Neil. Oh, for sure. So, Mr. Hunt, is this the, the footnote you were just referring to? Yes. Okay. And the footnote says that one single family dwelling is permitted per site, correct? That's what the what the words are. Okay. And, and there's no language in there that says it has to be accessory, correct? I don't see the word accessory. Okay. And in the table of uses, there is a use called single family dwelling detached, correct? There is. And in the CM zone, am I correct that it is a permitted use? It's it has a P in the table of uses. And P stands for permitted, not accessory, correct? Yes, it does. Okay. So, and I'm not trying to trick you, but where in the zoning ordinance does it say a dwelling has to be accessory to a Marine in the zoning ordinance? Uh, I mean, respectfully, I don't think it does, but if, if it does, then uh, I, I, you may have misspoke. I, I, I don't know, but I thought you had said the zoning ordinance requires a single family dwelling to be accessory to be an accessory used to a marina. I, I don't believe the ordinance says that, but but if you believe it does, can you share the provision with us? I can't, for, for right now I can't. I'd have to um, look it up, which I'm more than happy to do to see if I can find, if it says that. Mr. Murphy will put it on his screen. Okay, I can stop sharing if, and I'm asking for a provision in the zoning ordinance that says a dwelling has to be accessory to a marina on the CM property or to a marine use. No, all it says on schedule 32.1 development standards is that base density units per acre CM none, note four, which is one single family dwelling is permitted per site. Okay. So is it fair to say that it's not, you could have one lot that's zone CM and have a house on it and be in compliance with the zoning ordinance and no marine use? 
That would be, um, my feeling is that you couldn't do that because the comprehensive plan states as Mr. Murphy just read it. And so that would mean that you couldn't just have that as your principal use. If there were no, if there were no other marine use on the property. Okay. Um, let me ask you, and I apologize. I know I'm sharing a, a screen and I shared the wrong one. Had you reached that conclusion before tonight, Mr. Hunt, or did you reach it for the first time tonight? What 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 specifically are you talking about? That a, that a single family dwelling has to be accessory to a marine use if it's on CM property. I did not. I reached that decision before tonight. Okay, that that wasn't part of your decision in this case though, right? Uh, let me get that. The, the wording on the decision is that, well, part of it, the relevant part, I think, this proposal does not conform with the CZO Schedule 32.1 development standards, base density units per acre in CM zone equal none with note four, which reads one single family dwelling is permitted per site. Okay. Okay, let me, and, and uh, I'm sorry I got sidetracked. I was surprised you called it said that it needed to be accessory because I'd, I'd never heard that before tonight. Uh, but but I appreciate you, you answering the, those questions. I, I am going to go back to the to this chart and, and I appreciate you saying I didn't list all the accessory uses that are also allowed in CM um, that are non marine uses that there were other ones allowed that that are accessory. But the zoning ordinance specifically says that a dwelling unit detached is a permitted use correct. It does say that. Okay. So are you saying the zoning ordinance now is wrong? I'm saying that, that it can have... only be accessory? Yes, I'm saying you. the only way that you can have a detached dwelling unit is per footnote four. Well, no, that wasn't my question, respectfully. My question was, the zoning ordinance says a dwelling unit detached is a permitted use in the CM zone. And if I understood you correctly a moment ago, you said that you now believe it can only be an accessory use to marine use. So does that mean there's an error in the zoning ordinance and, and you don't think it really is a permitted use? That is correct. I do think there is an error. Well, and the, it, as Mr. Knight said earlier, this zoning ordinance was properly vetted and adopted by our county commissioners, correct? That is so. Do you have the authority to ignore the plain language of the zoning ordinance when you interpret it? No, I don't. Okay. And the plain language of this ordinance says a dwelling unit detached is a permitted use in the CM, correct? Only, it does say that, yes. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to show you again the language of, of your decision. Can, can you see the, the slide I'm sharing now? I have a copy of it. Oh, you do? Okay. If, that, if that's easier for you to, to look at, that, that makes a lot more sense. For it, so it's easier. I know it's hard on these screens. And I'm going to um, show you again the definition so we all have it in front of us of the um, of chapter 90. Is that showing before the board now, the CZO chapter 90 definition? No. no. 
It's not okay. I apologize. Now it is. Mr. Longmore? Mr. Longmore, are you there? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was on my my thing muted when I share my screen. I apologize. Um, so, so, Mr. Hunt, you can see the the definition of of site from Chapter 90, correct? Yes, I do. Okay, and my understanding of your decision that gave rise to this appeal is you do you believe that all of the CM zone property that's part of my client's application is one site in accordance with this definition. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So, so I find this definition a little confusing. I guess my question to you is, what language in this definition led you to believe that my client's property was one site? Any combination of lots where development is to be performed as part of a subdivision or project as shown on an application is a site. Okay. Does it matter that they're all owned by one party or do you think this definition would apply if multiple people own these lots? Well, it, it says they can be contiguous and in diverse ownership. Okay, so if six different people own these lots, you would still believe it's one site and only one of the lots could have a house. Is that your interpretation of this? I can't do that while I'm sitting here. That wasn't what was shown as uh, the facts that went with the application. The facts of the application what? are that all, all the property was under one ownership. It could be okay. under diverse ownership, but the, but the situation before us doesn't have that factor in it. Well, so if the only change was that the lots were owned by six different people, would that have changed your decision? If that was the only change, nothing in the plan, nothing else, but if six different people own these six lots, would you still believe it's what I'm trying to figure out how important the one ownership that's underlined in this version of it was to you or whether that really wasn't that important? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not sure how to answer that. The fact is that it's under one ownership and it's one site, as I understand the definition that we're talking about here. So beyond that, I'm afraid I can't follow you with your hypothetical. Okay, so even though this says in diverse ownership, you can't. if one of the lots were owned by one other person and five of them were owned by my client, would it still be one site? I mean, you've reviewed the site, you've seen the plans. If it were two owners applying together, I own lot 11 and my client owned the rest of them. Would you still view it as one site? I'd, I'd want to see that drawn up that way, Mr. Longmore, and have the chance to, to reflect upon what the difference may or may not be based on the difference between one ownership or diverse ownership. And I'm asking because, you know, part of the reason of this application, as Mr. Mahaffey testified to, was to try to get some feedback from the, the county as to how to develop this along the lines that my client wanted to. Um, so do you believe it may make a difference if there are multiple owners that more than one house could be drawn on the same piece of dirt? I'll go back to what I said before that I'd want to see a plan presented that had that as a fact in it. Okay, okay. Um, 
And I didn't see your name. We, we talked about the letter from Mr. Shire, and I know Mr. Murphy showed you only two paragraphs from that letter when he questioned you. Um, in 2014, were, were you with Land Use and Growth Management at that point? I was. Okay. Were, were you part of any of the review of this application in that time frame? I was not. Okay. We're, we're, and and I assume these answers, I just want to make sure I have them in the record. So is, it, is it correct to say you were not at the meeting that was referenced in that letter? I was not at that meeting. Okay. And likewise, you were not CC'd on the letter at the time it was done. I think if you'll look, I wasn't CC'd. I, I was just asking, I can show it if you want. I was just asking for the record to, to, to make sure. Um, did you ever discuss that letter with Mr. Shire while you were employed under him? No. Okay. Have you ever confirmed with Mr. Shire that that the interpretation of the ordinance and that letter that you shared just a moment ago were in fact what Mr. Shire meant when he sent that letter? No. Okay. Um, you heard the, the conversation in my questions with Mr. Knight earlier about the, the lot lines and whether any of the the structures that were shown on, on Mr. Mahaffey's plan, and I'll, I'll show it to you. Whether whether any of the structures shown on, on the plan were um, slightly over the property lines. Do you, you remember Mr. Knight testifying about that? Yes, sir. Did that have any relevance or any importance to you in making your decision in this case? No, sir. Okay. How about this, the setback discussion we had about how, you know, whether they violate the setbacks or whether they could be resolved some other way by reducing them or through a variance? Did that have any relevance to your decision? Only to the extent that what we thought we were doing was responding to Mr. Mahaffey's request based on what he provided us to look at. But, okay, and I'll, I'll be a little clear that that wasn't the reason why you denied the CM portion of this plan, correct? That's correct. And that didn't really have any relevance to your denial of it, other than looking at it, it looks like they're they're in the setback, correct? We're, um, which properties are you talking about? Uh, the CM properties with the, with the structures on them. The Mr. Murphy had raised the issue of them violating the setbacks with Mr. Knight. And my only question is, is that relevant to your denial of the CM portion of the property? No, it's not. Okay. Hmm. How about um, Mr. Murphy had asked about the provision in 32.1 about CM properties needing a, a one acre in size. I, I believe Mr. Knight had said that is applicable when you're subdividing CM property um, and not applicable to your decision or, you know, it doesn't really apply to what we're discussing tonight. Is that do you agree with that? I don't think that's relevant to what we're discussing tonight. Mr. Knight is, is likely correct without looking and thinking about it further about what he said. But the fact in the proposal that we're looking at is that the CM exceeds one acre and one acre is the minimum, minimum size specified for CM property. So it's larger than one acre and it exists. So I don't, under, you know, I don't, that's as far as, uh, I don't have any opinion other than that. Okay, and, and is it fair to say that that provision of the ordinance was not the basis or relevant to your denial or your disapproval of this application, the CM zone property portion of it? Are you asking, was the- what, what, Yeah, was, was that provision in 32.1 um, describing the one acre size of CM properties. Was that a reason or relevant to your disapproval of the CM property that was presented to you in this case? It wasn't. Was that part of your, okay. Yeah, it wasn't part of my thinking on this one. Okay, how about the, Mr. Murphy asked about the title of the application. Was that relevant to your decision? The title that I, that I, um, think is relevant wasn't the one that was discussed. The title to me that is important is the one that's on Mr. Mahaffey's plan, which is called Town, Town Creek Marina Development Sketch. Okay. 
So not the one that Mr. Murphy was questioning Mr. Knight about, but you think that that's relevant? Why is that that title relevant then? Why is this title relevant? Yeah, the one that I just read to you. Yes, because the property is named Town Creek Marina, to the best of my understanding. And what Mr. Mahaffey has prevented, prevented, presented is what he calls a development sketch of Town Creek Marina. Okay. When you say the property is called that, what do you mean by that? Well, I'm I'm trusting that Mr. Mahaffey has correctly identified the name of the property as Town Creek Marina. But that isn't like a formal name, right? That isn't in the title or it isn't a zoning requirement that it be named or anything like that, correct? No, I don't think the zoning ordinance has any requirements for titles of, of projects. Okay, okay. So that might just be historically what these properties were called. Is that a fair statement? Uh, I think I'm agreeing with you. If what I, what I think you just said was that this property has been known and called Town Creek Marina. If that was what your statement was, I agree. I agree with that's what I think is it's been known as. Okay. And you heard me ask Mr. Knight this, and again, I'm not trying to, to trick you on this. I'm trying to, to know for my client and for the board. Has, has this definition of site, as, as you interpret it, has it been applied to other CM properties in this way before, where an applicant has been either denied or told he can only have he or she can only have one dwelling on a CM site? Not to my knowledge. Okay. You heard Mr. Knight or we you heard me discuss the, the bed and breakfast issue with, with Mr. Knight? I did. So am I correct, or, or do you agree with, with Mr. Knight that it might be allowable to build the same number of structures as long as they're all part of, as he put it, one bed and breakfast? I think you said might. I mean, would the definition of site prevent that? I'd have to... A bed and breakfast wasn't part of the facts of this case. A bed and breakfast wasn't presented in this development sketch. If it were presented, then myself and Ms. Glenn, Mr. Knight, and any other folks who might be relevant to the review would look at it and form an opinion about that. Okay. Bed and breakfast are allowable uses on commercial marine sites, correct? Or commercial yes. marine properties, correct? They are allowed, yes. Okay. And that's use 55, correct? That's the number, yes. Okay. And that use requires that any new bed and breakfast shall have the appearance of a single family dwelling, correct? I've read that, yes. Okay. And... and Respectfully, Mr. Hunt, the, the whole issue before this case is this interpretation of the term site. And I'm not trying to trick you with hypotheticals, but I think it's important to understand your interpretation of it. If the owner of Lot 11 came in and applied for a bed and breakfast solely on Lot 11 here, do you know of any reason why the ordinance would not allow that use? I know there could be other developmental constraints. But as our director and the expert in the ordinance, do you know of anything that would prevent that on lot 11? I don't know of anything, but as I've said, that wasn't part of the facts that came with this application. So 
Um, without having it to review, I can't say entirely. To answer your question, I don't know of anything as I sit here tonight, but without reviewing the application, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't render a final decision or opinion without the opportunity to study the facts of that application that had the characteristics that you just described. And so I'm assuming you can't share with us or the board any opinion if my client handed you this exact application, everything drawn as it is, and each of these was labeled, well, they are labeled proposed buildings. They're not labeled proposed dwellings, I guess. But if each of those proposed buildings would be bed and breakfast instead of single family dwellings, do you think the definition of site would prevent those from being built on each of those lots? Mr. Longmore, I've got to say that I'd have to see the plan and have the opportunity to look at it before answering that. Okay. But the word site only applies to single family dwellings in the ordinance, correct? The word site only applies to single family dwellings? Well, footnote four is how the term site applies to this application, correct? Uh, let me review that. Okay. And I can pull it back up if you if you need it. The interpretation that I made is one single family dwelling is permitted per site with site referring to a CM site. Right, no, no I, and I, I appreciate that and, and I understand that. Um, so this is what we had looked at before, footnote number four. And it says one single family dwelling is permitted per site, correct? Yes. And footnote four only applies to the CM district? Yes. Correct. And it only applies to single family dwellings, correct? Correct. So is it, is it fair to say that only single family dwellings, the, the term, the limitation that the term site applies to in, in commercial marine districts only applies to single family dwellings, but not other uses that are permitted? Uh, could you say that again? It, it appears by this language that single family dwelling, only one single family dwelling is permitted per site is the language, correct? Yes, that's right. Uh, that footnote does not apply to any other uses other than a single family dwelling, correct, by its language? Correct. There is no restriction in the zoning ordinance that says there can only be one bed and breakfast per CM site, right? That's true. Is there anything else in the ordinance that would apply the term site to any other use other than single family dwelling? That's where you're losing me. The the um, the, the uh, definition of site that we've been going over is the definition for the entire zoning ordinance, not just for the CM zoning district. Yeah, and I and I apologize. I didn't word that artfully. I guess my my question is: there's a restriction that we're here talking about over two nights that you can only have, you know, your interpretation of this property is it's one site. And therefore, only one single family dwelling is allowed on this site, correct? Because it's a, a marina, yes. Right. But that footnote four only applies to single family dwellings, right? Correct. So it would not apply to bed and breakfast? It, it wouldn't apply to bed and breakfast. A, a CM zone property can have a bed and breakfast. Right. And these are six different lots, right? At least from your review? Uh, when you look at the, uh, the Sissels subdivision plant from 1929, there, 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 yes, you see numerous platted lots. Right. And, and I don't think this is in dispute. There's six lots in this CM area on Sissels that we're talking about, right? 
where uh, the area that you have circled in red. Right. And that's the property we're talking about tonight, right? Correct. Okay. So the CM property we're talking about consists of six separate recorded lots, correct? Correct. And without the restriction in footnote four, if you can meet other design criteria, aren't you normally allowed a separate permitted use on each lot? Subject to the development standard for the zoning district. Right, uh, absolutely. And, and I'm not disputing you on that. So with that in mind, it appears that each lot could have its own bed and breakfast, right? Because they're permitted uses. There's no footnote for limiting bed and breakfast. I agree with that. So each lot could have its own bed and breakfast, right? Well, once again, I, I would want to make my answer conditional um, because I don't have a plan to look at, but just as right. we're talking about it, I believe that's right. Okay, so just the use would be allowed on it. They'd have to meet setbacks, all the other zoning requirements that would need to be in there. But the use itself, you could get a bed and breakfast on each lot if it can meet all the other design criteria, correct? We're talking about those platted lots with CM right. zoning. Right. They are allowed to have uses permitted in the CM zone. And one of those uses is bed and breakfast. I'm just repeating right. to be sure that I don't get out of whatever lines you are trying to construct here. Right. No, and I think that's just so each lot could have that type of permitted use on each of the six lots. Yes. Okay. And each of those bed and breakfast, according to, to use number 55, would have to have the appearance of a single family dwelling, right? Uh, I haven't read that definition in the last few minutes, but that's my recollection. Okay. So someone driving by, it would look like six single family residences that would be allowed by use on these six lots. Well, Mr. Longmore, without having what's gonna be depicted in front of me, I wouldn't be able to agree with that. I would say okay. generally, if we're talking about the small size of the buildings that Mr. Mahaffey proposed, I don't know that those would really look like a single family dwelling in 2021. <clears throat> Is there a size requirement for single family dwellings in 2021? No. Okay. So what did you mean by, by that, your last statement then? I might've misunderstood you. Uh, I, we don't see building permits for new single family dwellings in St. Mary's County that are that small. Okay. But there's nothing prohibiting that size dwelling, right? Um, if we're, I'd really have to check and be sure that there's not some other restriction that's not obvious in some other code okay. with regard to a minimum square footage for habitable space and the like. Okay. I, I apologize, um, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I think those are all the questions I have from Mr. Hunt at this time. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Sure, Mr. Longmore. Hi, Mr. Hunt. Uh, How are you? Yeah. Nice to see you, Mr. Murphy. Good. So, even in just the last final moments of Mr. Longmore's cross-examination, mm -hmm. you were slightly hesitant to answer his hypotheticals. Does that sound fair? Well, I, yes, I was uh, hesitant to answer hypotheticals. Is that because Based, we're focusing on the definition of site, is that correct? That's part of what we're looking at. Right, and the key part of the definition of site is what's shown on an application, is that right? That's a critical component of it, that's shown on an application. So without further, without actually looking about at what's on an application, you can't say whether something is or is not part of the site, is that correct? Because it's an application as a whole, is that right? To have to have an accurate answer, it would have to be on an application. So whether it's being developed, okay. 
And okay. So he mentioned proposing one single family dwelling. Do you remember that? Just just one on the on the marine site? I don't remember that, but okay. that certainly probably did come up. Okay. And he also mentioned uh, proposing a second subsequent or uh, at the same time development. So whether those would be part of, whether those would be a site is all dependent on what's shown on the application. Is that right? Is that fair to say? Again, you're getting me into the hypothetical. Sure, area. sure. I'm not sure I'm following you. Basically what it comes down to is that it comes down to what is shown on an application. Is that right? Yeah, all our reviews have to be on something that we look at, which would be an application. And did the application here propose development as part of a unit project or subdivision? That's the way I interpreted it. And you mentioned that the title wasn't necessary. Well, the title that uh, Mr. Longmore, Harry, and I originally focused on, the CISL subdivision, wasn't as important as the one that's actually on the sketch. Is that right? That was, to me, the, the important uh, identifier of the project. And the title was Town Creek Marina Development Sketch. Was that right? That's correct. And it's important for, in your mind, because it shows development of that site as a single unit project or subdivision. Is that right? Correct. And let's take a look at the. Mm -hmm. And on a single unit, or on a, if it's a, okay, if it meets the definition of site, how many houses, how many single family dwellings are they allowed on a single commercial marine site? Time. On a single commercial marine site, you are allowed per footnote for one single family dwelling. How many do they propose here? Uh, we'd have to go back and count them. Six. Okay. And is six more than one? Yes. And is that why it was denied? Yes. And do you still stand by that decision? Yes. And is your decision in conformance with the CZO and the comprehensive plan? I believe it is. Nothing further. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, just one quick follow-up question based on or, or, on Mr. Murphy's The last time you were going to ask two if... questions, and we were here for a half hour, so make this one question a little shorter. <laughs> <laughs> well, and here's what, what I'm trying to – I understand, Mr. Hunt, you said because it was all on one application, that's what allowed you to define it as a site. What if my client had come in – with an application to build just one of the houses shown on one lot. And then a year later, he came in with a second application that just showed a house on a different lot. They'd be separate applications. I, I can't believe that's what makes this a site. Uh, uh, do you understand my question? Uh, no. Uh, as you told Mr. Knight, don't answer the question you think that you're answering. Okay. Yeah. So I, I don't understand the question that you're asking. So if my client came in with an application to build just one of the houses shown on the CM property, that would not have been denied based on the definition of site, right? Because there'd only be one house. That one house, we'd have to. I would go back and look at uh, the wording in the comprehensive plan with how, how residential use is addressed in that, even though you said that's not uh, determinative in this case, I would check on that and see if that complies with what that means from the comprehensive plan before having a, determ uh, a definite answer. Okay. But as I understood it, for, and I know I'm asking more questions, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, but I'm not sure. My question was clearly worded the first time. Mr. Murphy had asked you, it was because this was on one application, that was the reason why this is all one site, right? That was important to you. Yes, it is. If Mr. Mahaffey, instead of filing one application the day he did it, had filed six separate applications, that wouldn't be one application. Would that make a difference to you? No, because there would still be one site. Why? Because the property in question is zoned CM. It's not, it's not zoned RM that allows single family detached residential structures in a residential subdivision. Well, how do you draw the line in the middle of the site where the site ends and where it starts then? Don't have to in this case because it's the property that's zoned CM. 
Is all contiguous property, whether it's owned together or not, one CM site? All the property that's shown in Mr. Mahaffey's sketch on the part that we're talking about that has the real significant issue of the appeal is one property that's zoned CM. It's one site that's zoned CM. Okay. So it's not dependent on the one application. He could have filed six applications and that wouldn't have mattered. Um, he didn't do that. I would say that that probably is something that would matter, but as I'm looking at what was submitted, you've got one marina that covers the entire property, zone CM, that we're talking about. On that site, one single family dwelling is allowed for footnote four. That should be in some way, I don't have the wording of the comprehensive plan in front of me, it's not up on the screen. Um, residential uses, uses should be accessory to the marine use of the property. So the one residential use that you're allowed, one single family dwelling per footnote four, should be accessory to the marine use of the property. Okay. Those are all the questions I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you, you for the time. Um, I guess at this time, do we have the county do a summary and then the applicant, or does the board have any questions? Yeah, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, Mr. Lawnmower, this is Rich Richardson. Yes. Referring to uh, Hi, Mr. Richardson. McAfee's letter dated 10 July, you testified at the last meeting, it was, this was, letter was a request for guidance. And uh, Mr. McAfee, Right. In the last paragraph, it said, looking for a process forward. Go, do you still believe that's true? That's still your belief? Uh, I believe that's what Mr. Mahaffey was, was looking for when he submitted it. So that, that's his I, I don't a, a, a know that I believe that. process forward to be developed. Right. I, I believe that's what Mr. Mahaffey was looking for when he submitted it. Now, I understand the county you know, did not believe that it could be developed in that fashion in any way based on the director's interpretation. So they gave us the ability to bring it to you to kind of challenge that interpretation. That's what we're here, okay. here doing tonight. Thank you. And going to exhibit four, paragraph three, it states applicants submitted a letter to the development of land use and growth management seeking a review and revised sketch plan and a process for going forward. What was your reaction when you got the answer that says disapproved final decision? Well, I mean, it, you know, my client can share what his may have been. My reaction as his attorney was we have to appeal and bring it to you or they're going to lose the right to ever challenge it again. Um, we, we disagreed with the interpretation. We, we had meetings with staff ahead of time letting them know we disagreed with it. Um, we had real concerns that it's ignoring the fact that there's different lots there and we don't think the definition is clear enough to restrict the property the way they're doing. Um, but uh, I mean, I'll be honest. I know the questioning sometimes gets a little uh, you know, heated or, or it seems like we're, we're arguing a lot. In this case, Mr. Hunt as director has interpreted it this way. We have a very different uh, reading of it than he does. And we believe the board's the appropriate group to, to decide which is you know both correct and, and most appropriate um so, so that's really why we're here tonight i mean my my client would have rather tried to work through this but i think the county drew a, a very uh, solid line in the sand that they weren't going to consider anything more than one dwelling and we believe that he had the right to to build one on each lot it, it just sounded like to me reading the letter that, that mr mccaffey was asking for help was that true uh, I, I, I think that's right. And I heard, you know, Mr. Knight's position was that, you know, we weren't accepting their answer to it. But I, I think they were, you know, some of the questions I'm asking tonight that are being taken as hypotheticals are, are trying to get at that. You know, what else could have been done um, to, you know, and I think this interpretation was a, an immovable object for us having those discussions with them. And that's why we're here you know, hopefully getting a resolution to that one way or another, and then my client will know, you know, whether we're right or, or the director's right. Thank you. 
Mr. Brown? Uh, actually, I've got some. I'll start off with Mr. Hunt. This is John Brown. Um, much was made last time about the uh, de development review application that, that Mr. Mahaffey filled in and put his other. My question is, what does a zoning review of development entail? That was what was in that block. I think you're muted, Mr. Hunt. Yeah, the, when a development application comes in, most of the time for something that's going to require a review by TEC, perhaps the Planning Commission, it goes through those processes. In this case, I think Mr. Longmore used the term immovable object or a, a position that wasn't going to change. That was correct, but staff knew that Mr. Mahaffey's position wasn't going to change either. So when we had two positions that were in opposition and couldn't be resolved, there was no point in sending a, a, a development application that showed all these houses because at the end, I would have turned it down and there would have been a waste of time and money. This way, knowing how the applicant felt, by rendering a decision, it comes to the Board of Appeals, which is where it would have ended up anyway. It's the quickest and most efficient way to get a resolution between two parties when neither one is going to be able to uh, give the other one, uh, is, is going to be able to accede to the other one's position. Well, when one brings a sketch to your office and basically asks for help, do you make them fill this form out and they have to do the, and you have to go through this process? Or do you actually sit down and work with them with alternatives? Like I heard when Mr. Knight testified, hey, I disagree with the, with the one residence, but you know, you can do bed and breakfast. In other words, I'm, until we got to this meeting here, I'm not sure that any of that got thrown on the table. Um, in other well, words, Mr. Brown, in the real world, work. how do you handle when somebody's asking for help? If they're asking for help, we're glad to provide it. When you look at Mr. Mahaffey's letter, what he said was he wanted to have waterfront single family dwellings. When that's what he wanted, Where? The only way to get that would be to get this decision before the Board of Appeals and let you decide what the correct interpretation is. He didn't want any of the other uses that are allowed in CM. Had he come before us and say, hey, I want to know what I can put on a CM property, we would, of course, provide uh, guidance in that direction. That wasn't what was asked for. That wasn't what we understood the situation to be. We understood it to be, this is what we want, and this is all that we want. Okay. Uh, it seems to me I heard, I, I've got to throw this question back to Mr. Longmore and Mr. Mahaffey. You've heard that statement. Is that what you understood? Well, I, I mean, I'll share this. And, and again, I think the reason we're here is that we have very different interpretations of the way they're applying the term site to, to this application. I'm not talking um, about a site. I'm talking about walking in and asking for help and, and having to go through a formal process because you assume that you all are, that's the only way you're going to go. Do you agree with that? I and I can let Mr. Mahaffey, you know, share because he was the one that was working with them. Honestly, it's probably better for Billy. To, I, I had one meeting at the end of it, but Billy was the one. So, Mr. Mr. Mahaffey, if you can, Mr. Mahaffey, before you start, could I swear you in, please? Um, sure. Would sure, you please stand and raise your right hand? Do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, to answer your question, Mr. Brown, I, I, I think I would have been very open to a suggestion of how else the land can be used. But what was that again? Through all of this testimony, I, I, I believe that I would have been open to options if there if there were any were presented. I mean, I don't I don't think I was so strident in my position that I wouldn't have been open to other um, other options. But but I'm not sure that that's really I'm not sure that's the question that's really at hand. Well, I read your letter as I'm asking for help. Alternatives are requested. It, that is, am I reading that correct? I guess I'm not. No, I, I was. I was looking for help. This is a very difficult project. It 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 is subject to many setbacks and and critical area law and and all sorts of things because these are non-conforming lots. And and this is what we wanted to do. I have never known a single family lot in in or out of the critical area to be denied a a permit that that when it met the standards and and I thought this you know I just thought this was a reasonable application so I was looking for a way forward through the myriad of 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 regulations that had to proceed okay uh, Mr. McCaffrey, if, if I could butt in a minute you're asking for a way forward and what you got was a total rejection and final the final well, decision were you happy with that uh, yes it was it, it, yes sir What was that? Would you answer that again, please? Were you happy with the decision? Uh, yes, sir. That, yeah, we, we received a denial, you know, to, yeah, and not, not the way forward. I don't know. And, and, and I guess, Mr. Chairman, if, 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 if I may step in. We're, you okay. asked for help, and you asked for a way forward. And the decision came in, basically says no final decision. Were you happy with that or unhappy with that? Well, well, of course, you know, it wasn't what I was looking for. So, you know, I spoke with Mr. Burkhardt and we and we formed a, you know, a strategy to, you know, to appeal the process because that's really the only option we had to do. So you were looking for help with the process. I mean, I believe that's what I was asking. Go ahead. Um, I would like to bounce back to Mr. Hunt, if you would. Uh, when somebody brings it in, do you, uh, what kind of form do you make them fill out when they're just asking for help? Do you have a form that says help or what? Or do you make them fill out this form that you have here? What I tried to do is make it easy for the person to file an appeal and get it before the Board of Appeals when there isn't going to be agreement at, between staff and the applicant. And I refer you back to Mr. Haffey's letter for what I thought was his intention as stated in that letter. So there is no special form for help. So when you had Mr. Mahaffey complete the uh, the uh, development review application that was the only form and and check other that was your your avenue correct that that was a quick way to get it before the board of appeals to get the issue resolved given that mr mahaffey's request was for six single family dwellings on a cm property he wasn't asking us for alternatives he was asking us to approve what he wanted to submit. If he had wanted other uses, he knew that he could go and apply, change his request for any use allowed in the CM zone. This was the use that he wanted, was my understanding. I think, I, Chairman, I beat this horse to death. Yeah. Mr. Mahaffey, this is Dan Eknowski. How many years have you been working for the engineering profession and developing plans for land use in St. Mary's County? Oh, that was the question. 31 years. Thank you. Can I follow up? I, I lied to you, Mr. Chairman. One of my questions was, uh, other than the, what, 2014 initiative, 
How many other times have you come forward relative to this property? I, I seeking think any the questions request, or answers? Just, just the 2014 and this one? I had had many meetings with many agencies prior to that request for land use to kind of get on board with the pro with the process. I honestly, when I read Phil Shire's letter, I thought it was a way forward. My real effort in this last with the case that came up last year was to continue that effort since so much time had passed. No regulation had changed, but but time had passed and people had changed. Okay, I'll shut up now, Mr. Chairman. Well, you don't have to do that. We want to get the question. That's it. If, if I may ask, Dan Knowski again, with the guidance that you got from Phil Shire in 2014, what happened after that? Why did the project not go forward? I'm going to say that with that letter in hand and the the, the other letters that we had from the Health Department and, and Metropolitan Commission, that the, the owner attempted to market the property to sell that as depicted on the concept plan. He didn't want to proceed that. He didn't want to go through that process. And, and when he was not able to sell the property, then he moved forward to do it himself. I have no further questions. Anybody else? No. no I mean. Okay. Um, I think I might have misspoken, but I think now, Mr. Murphy, you still have the floor. Do you have any other witnesses to call? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do not. No, thank you so much. And Mr. Longmore, you had indicated last meeting that you may have an additional rebuttal witness. Do you have an additional witness? Um, no, I, I, as rebuttal, I only have, it's along the lines of what Mr. Mahaffey, it's just a couple of questions for Mr. Mahaffey and rebuttal to some of the statements that were made. And it'll take, I only have a couple of questions for him. He and I have discussed them, it'll be very brief. Okay, please. <laughs> yeah, right. And Mr. Mahaffey, I, Give Mr. Hunt's testimony. I'm not sure that it's as relevant as we thought it was when we spoke today, but the plan that you submitted, was it your intention that all of the structures were on physically on the lot lines and not crossing them? Absolutely. I, I intended there to be a, a building, a dwelling on each lot with no crossing of a property line. Okay. And, and going back to that 2014 letter um, from Mr. Shire to you, the plan that was presented to Mr. Shire at that time included more than one dwelling on the CM properties we've been talking about, correct? Indeed, it did. Okay. It, it, so, it did. We objection. We don't have that in evidence. I know. I know. Yeah, I don't think it's. He's testifying file. under oath. He's testifying under oath, Neil. What he submitted. I think he has personal knowledge of. Sure. I was going to say best evidence rule, but yeah, <laughs> doesn't apply. Sure. Okay. So, Mr. Mahaffey, do you have a, a particular knowledge of what you submitted to Mr. Shire then? I, I do. In in my records, um, there is a there is a sketch that showed instead of single families, they were attached single families, attached duplexes. They were duplexes, will. right? The yeah. the purpose the purpose of that was to 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 limit the footprint of disturbance within the critical area. And then you've learned since then that duplexes are not allowed. We're, we're not allowed, but we changed the use to single family detached. Okay. But in, in those discussions prior to Mr. Shire's letter with him and the submittals you'd made to the county, there were more than one dwelling unit. There was more than one dwelling unit on the CM lots, correct? That you were proposing? De definitely, yes. Okay. I, I think it's mentioned in, in Phil's letter that it was seven, but I think he really miscounted. I think there were eight. Right. And you didn't put six of them on the RM property and only one on the CM, right? No, no, it's, it's, okay. it's factually as presented, except they were duplexes as opposed to single family detached. 
Okay. No further questions, you, okay. uh, Mr. Um, Chairman. Thank, thank you. you. I have one question. Uh, yes, ma'am. So, Billy, uh, referring to the 214 letter, when you went before, when Mr. Shar went before and said that you could not do the duplexes, now you fast forward to now when you went and asked for sing single family dwellings that was denied. You really weren't going there to ask for help. You were still wanting to develop each lot individually, correct? You never went with any uh, ask to, for help as giving suggestions from Mr. Hunt. Ooh, I, I can change my own it, it was truly my recollection that this, this letter supported the development that we proposed and we were moving forward with that. I, if, if that letter says that the single family attached dwellings, the duplexes were not permitted, I, I don't recall that in the letter. But I mean, it may have said it, but I don't recall it. it. You did not move forward with it in that, all that time. I, I did not hear what you said. I'm I said sorry. You did not move forward with it then during all that time. And when you went back, yeah, as I, the idea was still the same to develop these six individual dwellings. I, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. I think I answered that. I think Your I answered that question. Your intent all along the, was to develop these six lots individually. Just a yes or no? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it was. Okay. So when you went to talk to Mr. Hunt this last time, your intent was not to find out what else could be put on those lots. Your intent was still to develop these six lots. It, it, it was, but I mean, I read Phil Shire's letter as as a an agreement to move forward with the development. I, may be. I did not see that as, no, you cannot do that. I mean, I, I just don't, I don't read that letter to see to, to, that it says that we cannot proceed. I understand, but you did not proceed and you went back and asked again the same question. Thank you. Um, is it appropriate, any other questions, excuse me? No. Is it appropriate that Mr. Murphy also do a summary? Yes, yeah. Um, so why don't we do that? We'll start off with Mr. Murphy doing the summary. And then we'll let you do one also, Mr. Longmore. Certainly, thank you. In about 10 minutes. Oh, actually, Mr. Chair, I believe it's it might be reverse order because he's the appellant. So he goes first, then I go, and then he has rebuttal. Uh, Mr. Longmore? I mean, I'm happy to let you okay. go, Neil, and I, I can go twice. Or no, I, don't mind, I don't mind either way. I just, that was just my understanding. Okay, let's do that then, Mr. Longmore. Go I'm ahead. fine. Okay. No, no, that's fine. Yeah, that, that'd be fine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, members of the board. Um, you know, there's there's a a few things to, to raise just in closing, and I know you've heard all the testimony. We appreciate all the attention that you've given this matter. We know it's been over two nights, and, and it's taken some time. Um, I'm not going to belabor some of the points we've made. Um, respectfully, I think some of the points in the county's case um, about lot lines and setbacks and titles are, are, aren't are what's relevant here. Um, and, and I'll be clear representing my client. My client believes that, um, and we believe and we assert that the zoning ordinance does not prevent him from building one single family dwelling on each of these lots. He has six recorded lots. Um, we believe that each lot has a development right on it and there is nothing in the zoning ordinance that does not allow the permitted use of a single family dwelling on the ordinance. And of course, Mr. Hunt disagrees. His interpretation um, is different. What I'd ask the board to do in, in reviewing this is, and, and I think this is the most appropriate way to do it. I, I think starting with that June 2014 letter is important um, to put this in context. And what I mean by that is certainly Mr. Hunt is the director now. He has the right to make the decisions that he believes in. I have every, I have no doubt he believes this is the right interpretation. I respect him and I know he takes his job seriously and, and 
and um, and he works very hard at it. But I would ask the board members to read the entire letter, not the couple of excerpts that are in the county's PowerPoint, but the full letter that's in ours or, or as an attachment to the exhibits and read that letter and see what you think the letter says. Mr. Knight and Mr. Hunt both testified that Phil Shire's letter fully supports that you can only have one house on the entire CM property consisting of the six lots. I don't read the letter that way. I think the letter when read as a whole uh, does not say that. And, and I think looking at it in context, and that's why I asked Mr. Mahaffey to clarify it. The fact that he was proposing more than one dwelling in the CM zone when that letter was written, and there is no affirmative statement in there saying, hey, on the CM portion, you can only have one lot. It wasn't as clear as Mr. Knight and Mr. Hunt lead you to believe. I read it very differently. Now, I take them at their word that that's how they read it, but I read it very differently. I just ask you to read it from beginning to end. And I think that puts in context where my client was. He didn't think he had any problem in putting single family dwellings on that because he'd never been told he could not do it until 2020 when he came back in and found out that this was now an issue with the county. Um, nobody was there in the county. Mr. Hunt, Mr. Knight, we're not part of those discussions. Unfortunately, we don't have anybody that was there, but Mr. Mahaffey was, and he knows what he submitted. Um, and of course, you're not bound by that if that's what Mr. Shire did. You're bound by what the ordinance says and applying the language of the ordinance and seeing if you agree with our interpretation or Mr. Hunt's. But I think that's important, and that gives some context to why there was not urgency on our part to come in and challenge it then, because that's not how Mr. Mahaffey read the letter at that time. And I don't think it's what it says. For to say that, you got to come in already interpreting the term site the way Mr. Hunt does. And I don't think anybody had raised it at that point. Um, so if we, you know, one of the comments that was brought up last time is why didn't my client come in and ask to rezone this property during the rezoning process? Because then he could have solved all its problems. He didn't do that because he didn't know he had a problem. He found that out in 2020 mm. after the Lexington Park plan had already been done. And, and then what we do is we go and look at the language of the ordinance. And, and the only thing stopping this, in my opinion, and, and I think it's clear from the testimony of Mr. Hunt and Mr. Knight, the and just the, the denial itself, and I apologize, I'm, I'm skipping through slides here, but the only language in here, and, I, and I'll, I'll pull it up to show you. Um, this is the definition that, in our opinion, the, the department is using to restrict my client down from building six houses to one. Now, now read this a few times in its entirety. If you read this and take it to the end that we believe the director is taking, this means that all properties that are adjacent to each other in the CM, it means that only one resident, <laughs> one single family residence can be on them, regardless of who owns them. I mean, it can't mean that, right? And it says that, and it doesn't make sense. So then the question was, you know, I asked some hypotheticals because I don't understand how they're reading this definition. It's an awful definition. It's not written well. Um, and what this definition, you know, I mentioned in my, in my statements last time, the word site comes up in the ordinance 156 times. I think it's fair to say that this definition was not written with CM in mind or this issue in mind. It was a word that was used in that footnote, and we don't know what the intention was. It wasn't what land use of staff's intention was. It's what the county commissioner's intention was when they adopted it. And I don't think they meant to erase lot lines and say you can only have one house, even if you own six lots that are commercial marine. <clears throat> and what we'd ask you to do is look at this and say, this definition does not make sense and maybe give us some definition, give us some direction as to, you know, the reason why I asked, could we have, have applied with six different applications? If the only reason he denied it is because it was shown on one application, we can do that, but that's absurd to have to do that. If the only reason was it was under one ownership, 
respectfully, my client can convey it out to different people he knows and put a house on each lot. This definition should not restrict development rights the way that the staff and the director has applied it. We don't think that's what it meant. We think that what it means and what the most obvious reading of footnote four is, is that it isn't site the way they're interpreting it. The, the easiest way to do it is to apply it to each lot that's there. Now, I still don't know why they think this group of properties is one site. I don't know if it's because it was used as a marina before, and so now it's stuck that way for every, forever as one site. If three of these lots were one marina and three of these lots were another one, does that mean now that Mr. Burkhardt could put two houses, one on each side of the marina? It just doesn't make sense to divide it that way and to limit somebody's property rights so much by a vague definition in the back of the zoning ordinance. I do take strong exception with Mr. Hunt's interpretation now that even though the zoning ordinance says it's permitted, that it can only be accessory now. I don't think he as director is allowed to rewrite the zoning ordinance that way. The comprehensive plan is more general. The zoning ordinance is more specific. I think the way that you read those together is to say, when the county commissioners adopted the zoning ordinance, after they adopted the comprehensive plan and did all the amendments with it, that was their interpretation of what the plan meant. And so I think you gotta look at the comprehensive zoning ordinance and not one sentence in one provision of the comprehensive plan and say that that now changes the chart from permitted to accessory. And that's essentially what that argument was. So we just ask that you look at, read that letter in whole. And respectfully, I think Mr. Hunt interprets this differently than the way the county did before. He has the right to do it. It's just, we agree with the prior interpretation. And we think that, that this one, you know, why there could be, you know, I'm not saying he's doing it in bad faith, but when you look at the language as a whole, we asked the board to interpret it much more reasonably and, and apply it the way that we asked. Now, Mr. Murphy raised a couple other things after our opening, you know, looking at single family houses in that neighborhood and saying that was zoned differently than Sam. It certainly is. The reason why we showed those aerial photos in this case as well, allowing Mr. Burkhart to proceed this way would not change the nature of this community at all. In fact, it would be more in line. Uh, with the rest of it. That's the only reason we showed that to you. That may or may not be hugely relevant, but we thought it may be something the board would consider. So for those reasons, we'd ask that um, you apply the interpretation that we're suggesting, and I'll be happy to provide a brief rebuttal after Mr. Murphy. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Murphy. Thank you. Good, good evening. Let me get my screen. Um, just one moment. Perfect. Can everybody see the PowerPoint? Yes. Perfect, thank you. So good evening, everyone. I'm asking that you uphold the decision of Land Use Director Bill Hunt and disapprove of the Pound Creek development sketch for two reasons. First, one of the proposed buildings on the Residential Marine Zoning District didn't meet the 10-yard side yard setback. And second, and most importantly, Mr. Mahaffey's application presented the development as a single site proposing six single-family dwellings in the CM District. As a result, the sketch in the, in the application as a whole did not meet the base density standards of the CZO, which mandate only one single family dwelling per site. And during rebuttal, and I found this particularly crucial, during rebuttal, Mr. Mahaffey admitted to Ms. Delahaye that his intent all along, going back to at least 2014, was to develop this property with single family dwellings. He admitted he wasn't really looking for help, that he wanted a final decision on the sketch because he wanted to move the project ahead. That's also what's in his letter. And in fact, if you remember, Mr. Knight testified that there are a number of emails back and forth between him, between Mr. Mahaffey and Lugum, 
all asking for a different answer to the same question, which is whether he could put more than one single family dwelling on a single CM site. This is the almost the exact same project that he got a letter from Mr. Shire for in 2014. Harry stepped in after nothing was progressing over email, and Mr. Knight, or Mr. Hunt testified that his decision was the fastest and cheapest way to resolve the question, and that's why we're here, because Mr. Mahaffey wants to develop the CM site with single family dwellings. He wasn't looking for help. He wants one thing, and that's why we're here. So as for the RM zoning district and setback violation on the RM property, um, going over this briefly, there's an obvious violation on the 10 yard side yard setback as shown on the street screen. And this would obviously normally be resolved uh, with comments to either fix the size of the building or with a, um, a variance of the side yard setback could be met. So I agree, denying it on this part was mature but Mr. Mahaffey, as stated during rebuttal, when Mr. Ms. Delahaye was, test was questioning him, Mr. Mahaffey wanted a final answer because his intent all along was to develop these properties with single family dwellings. So he did what was asked. He submitted an application and that application is what Lugum received and reviewed for a final decision. So instead of sending comments back, Lugum disapproved of it, of the site, because it didn't meet the setback standard and they're, of course, they're welcome to resubmit with a corrected setback or request a variance, but that's not what's before the board. What's before the board is a final decision on a defective application as to the side yard setback, and we ask that you uphold the decision based on that. Now, as for the commercial marine zoning district, the reason why we're all really here is to have the board define uh, how the word site is to be used in commercial marine zoning districts. So we can start briefly with the purpose of the CM district. And I'm not gonna read all of this because we went through it during the hearing, but nowhere is residential development listed in that purpose. And while single family dwellings are a permitted use in schedule 50.4, every use, every use in St. Mary's County must adhere to the development standards for its zoning district and its land use category. Here, the zoning district is commercial marine, not sometimes commercial, but mostly residential marine. And the CZO mandates that only one single family dwelling per marina site is allowed in that district. And the land use category is marine use. So as you saw during Bill Hunt's testimony, the comp plan states that single family dwellings should be accessory to the marina and should be as important because that emphasizes the spirit and intent of the comp plan, uh, which is to, and so let's start by going over the development standards in the CM district, sorry for that. So again, the development standards for the CM district are located in 30.2 and we've gone over this, but there is and only can be one marina site in this CM district. As a result, they get one single family dwelling. And of, as of, of course, this makes sense. Harry went over it and the history of this development or density requirement. Originally, back in 2002, the density was listed at zero without any footnotes. And then the footnote was later added because staff recognized that sometimes marine operators live on site and they didn't want those homes to be non-conforming. So they added the footnote, which now allows one single family dwelling per marina site. But again, and importantly, the base density remained zero because there are plenty of other residential zoning districts in St. Mary's County, and that's where residential development should occur. So let's look at the comp plan. Harry's history of the footnote also aligns with the comp plan, which states that residential uses should be accessory to the marina. And I think Bill Hunt may have misspoken when he said that it must be accessory to the marina because the comp plan says it should be. So when a use is accessory, it must serve the marina operation and its guests. As Mr. Mahaffey stated, if I owned one of those properties, the marina guests and the marina operator couldn't come to my home. So by Mr. Mahaffey's own testimony, those homes are unrelated to the operation of the marina and therefore can never be classified as an accessory. And contrary to what Mr. Longmore is trying to do, the comp plan and CZO are not inconsistent, nor is Mr. Lo Mr. Hunt trying to reinterpret or rewrite the zoning ordinance. The CZO permits one single family dwelling on a marina site, and the comp plan says that this permitted dwelling should be, not must be, accessory to the marina. In other words, the spirit and intent 
of the commercial marine areas is to keep them marine sorry is to keep them marine uses not as residential developments so neither the comp plan nor the czo can be read to allow it's on the application which is a single or as, which is a minor subdivision at a single a marine site by itself or in this case further development of an existing major subdivision so while a single family dwelling is a permitted use throwing a subdivision or any number of houses, more than one probably, that don't serve that marina do not satisfy the spirit and intent of the comp plan. They never represented or never presented any reason why we should not deviate from the should be accessory to the marine use language in the comp plan. So just as this board denied the 7-Eleven in Leonardtown for violating, for violating the spirit and intent of the comp plan, I ask that you apply the same reasoning to disapprove of the sketch today. Mr. Knight also pointed out that all the other sites in the CM, all the other CM sites in the Leverings have only one single family dwelling at each marina. And he also stated that in fact, there's only one single family dwelling at the CM site we're talking about today. Because literally everybody knows the rules. One marina, one house. And to Chris's point, or actually to, they could have changed this in 2019 to change the CM district to RM or another zoning district that would have allowed the proposed development. They say they didn't think so, they needed to, but they did. So they're stuck with the consequences. Just as Harry's family is stuck with the consequences of not developing their farm to have 250 homes when that was allowed, and just as an existing vacant lot in an industrial zone might have a development right, but they can't build a house there because the maximum density in that zone is zero, or the base density in that zone is zero. While each lot has a development right, changes in density, change what can be built. But as Mr. Longmore himself pointed out, his clients still have reasonable use of the CM property to suggest, to suggest that they're down zoned or that we're preventing them from commercial or profitable uses of their, of their properties is, is outrageous. I have Mr. Longmore's slide on the screen. And as I went over with Mr. Hunt, that slide highlighted the 20 non-marine uses that are allowed on the property, 11 of which are completely permitted, and that use increases to 29 if you include the, include the marine uses, and even more if you include the accessory uses. So when Mr. Longmore showed this slide, I actually think it was to his client's detriment, because as you can see from Mr. Longmore's own presentation, the one marina, one house rule still allows them reasonable use of the land. Specifically, it allows them to construct one single family dwelling to serve the marina and still have 28 uses for the property. In other words, he could use the commercial marine zone in its entirety for its intended commercial marine use. As Harry pointed out, he could build the same number of homes for the same footprint on the CM property, but use those homes as part of a bed and breakfast or short-term lodging. Or even as he pointed out uh, today, he can construct even more residential units than he's proposing, so long as he actually puts them on the RM property. His clients have had a very specific idea of what they want since at least 2014, but under the zoning ordinance and the comp plan, they can't get it. And that's because of why we're here, one dwelling unit per marina site. And again, let's go over the definition of site one more time. Any, and I'm just gonna read the highlighted part, or the underlined parts, any combination of lots which are in one ownership where development is to be performed as part of a unit, subdivision, or project as shown on an application. And that last part is key. What is shown on the application is key. So what Mr. Longmore tried to ask hypotheticals, what about the first house? What about the second house? What about six houses? That doesn't matter because what matters based on the definition of site is what's on an application. And here, Mr. Mahaffey's application proposed the development of a combination of lots in the CM zone, specifically lots nine through 13 and 22. They're in one ownership, but even if they were in diverse ownership, the lots are still contiguous, so we're within that definition. The project name lists the original subdivision name, Sissel Subdivision. The application used a single sketch for the entire project, labeling it the Town Creek Development Sketch, meaning that it's part of a single development. They ignored the lot lines and setback requirements, no. which, 
by themselves may not mean anything, but it allows them to, but by in, invoking the definition of site allows them to ignore these lines. So when you, you don't follow the setback site or setback lines or setbacks or lot lines, you can only do that by a few number, a few ways under the CZO, and one of those is by invoking the definition of site. And moreover, under the application and in Mr. Mahavi's testimony, they'll all share a single point of sewage. And again, they're all on one application. And based on the application that they submitted, it forms a single site, so they get one single family dwelling. Mr. Hunt's decision should not have been a surprise. And Mr. Ms. Delahaye, I think, pointed this out in her uh, in her examination of Mr. Mahaffey. Just like Mr. Hunt, Mr. Shire considered the entire development to be part of a single site. That's the red box at the top. Then he lists the regulatory constraints from the CZO. Those are the boxes in the middle. He cited the exact same development standards that Mr. Hunt cited, which mandate the only or the one single family dwelling site dwelling per site rule. And as Harry pointed out. The words dwellings and footprints are used because they're proposing, they were proposing dwellings, dwellings plural on the RL at that time, just as they're proposing two dwellings with two footprints in the RM on this application. However, just as we interpret the one dwelling per site rule, Mr. Shire did the same. So let's talk about the CM district regulatory site constraints, because that's really where it comes down to. I think the last line is especially key, because I've been repeating the one dwelling per site rule uh, a lot. The last line begins with schedule 50.4.15, that's the residential use, or that's the single family dwellings, of the CZO notes that only a detached dwelling unit is permitted in the CM district. Not detached dwellings are permitted, only a detached dwelling. So while Mr. Shire uses footprints and dwellings in different parts of the letter, we know that he's not talking about the CM district because only a detached dwelling is permitted here. He recognized that it's a permitted use, but it must conform to the one marina per uh, one per marina rule. So just as it was treated in 2014 like that, it's treated like it that today. They could have called Mr. Shire to testify, and this is what's really important. They didn't. It's their burden as the applicant to prove that Lugum was wrong in its interpretation and to prove that their evidence that they submitted, Mr. Shire's test or his letter, uh, proved something else. They didn't, they didn't call Mr. Shire, they didn't call anybody that was CC'd on that or anybody was at, that was at that meeting, and therefore they haven't met their burden. And they didn't call Shire or Mr. Shire because they know, as we do, that Mr. Shire wrote that one house is permitted per site in the CM. And they can't get around the one house, one marina rule by making, oh, yeah. Moreover, they can't get around the definition by presenting six different applications for these six houses and calling each one site. The first, might be and probably is allowed as one single family dwelling, but any further residential development would be part of that first site and therefore not allowed. Because again, the comp plan states that residential uses in a marine use land use category should be accessory to the marine use and none of the six houses are accessory. Um, and they want it again, one marina, one house. They wanted six. So it's denied. Directly, Director Hunt correctly determined that the Town Creek Marina Development Sketch failed to satisfy the setback and density standards. And we ask that this board upholds the decision. There's one single project under one common ownership, part of one larger subdivision on a single sketch, sharing septic, ignoring lot lines and setbacks, and on one application. That's the definition of site. And we ask that you apply it here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Board members. Thank you. We're past our time. Would you like to hear the rebuttal and save the decision making for the next meeting? Can I ask what the weather is outside? Because we've got a young lady that's got to drive to Annapolis over there. So it sounds like we can do both for the next meeting because we still got a couple of items to approve. Yeah, I understand. That's all that's left is Mr. Longmore, right? I'm sorry. And it, how, how long is his? Uh... Mr. Longmore, how you how long are you going to be? Uh, I mean, I can be brief, Ms. Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, a few minutes just to respond to some of the points uh, Mr. Murphy made. But I'm happy to wait till next time if it's a safety. We'll have to come back next time for the decision anyway. So, so I'm happy to do whatever the board prefers. Next time, it's okay. fine by me. Next time, continue it. I can vote right now. 
I can do it right now. Huh? I can do it right now. Mr. Mr. Okay, I, mean, I, I could too, but I mean, we're a little out of time. Um, Mr. Longmore, please be brief. Go ahead with your rebuttal. I don't know which way it's going to go. Certainly, just a, just a few points. Um, one of the things that I kept hearing during, during the closing statement and through the testimony of the county counties are heavy handed. Was one marina, one house. The problem is that commercial marine properties do not have to be used as marinas. You can look at the list of them. You don't have to have a marina just because it's called commercial marine. And Mr. Murphy and Mr. Hunt and the whole staff know that. Um, you're allowed to do whatever is permissible, permissible in that use category. Uh, certainly we presented that to show other uses are allowed there to show how absurd this interpretation of the word site is. If you can build six bed and breakfasts that look just like six single family residences, it shows how absurd it is to say that you cannot build a single family residence on each one. I take exception with what Mr. Murphy said, and he said I might have hurt my client by saying this. I don't think that's appropriate for him to make those kind of statements. But he's also missing the entire point. This is not a takings case. We were not claiming we're denied all use of our property because of this decision. We're claiming we have the right to put a single family house on each lot that my client owns, plain and simple. Not that he can't do other things, but that he's allowed to do this thing under the ordinance. That's what they don't understand. And that's what's important here tonight. Um, there's also a reference to another case I did with a concept site plan talking about the, the comprehensive plan. That's completely inappropriate. That's one of the standards for a concept site plan. Mr. Murphy knows that full well. What we're here to look at tonight, the language that he cited even said it should be accessory to the marine use. But Mr. Hunt said commercial marine properties don't have to have a marine use. So maybe you can interpret that that should should only be there if there is a primary marine use. That's not how my client wants to use his property. What we're saying is the zoning ordinance says single family residences are allowed on commercial marine sites. It is a permitted use in the zoning ordinance. There's a footnote that says one per site. There's a very big definition of site in the back of the zoning ordinance. And we believe that looking at that alone, forget Phil Shire's letter, looking at that alone, that this board should interpret it more in favor of the property owners of this county than what a, a vague definition can be applied by to, to the folks that are applying it here tonight. That is what we are asking the board to do and in, in looking at this. Um, so we appreciate your time tonight. I, I think a lot of the, the, the arguments that were presented really don't get to the heart of this. We believe the fact is that this is a permitted use, that my client happens to own six lots that are all commercial marine. And we did not call Phil Shire because you know what? His opinion doesn't win or lose the day now. As to the letter, Mr. Murphy did it again. He only showed you a couple paragraphs of it. He didn't show you the whole letter. Please just read the whole letter. Don't take my word for it. Don't take Mr. Murphy's word for it. Read it yourself and see if you think Phil Shire told my client you can only have one house on your whole commercial marine site. It's up to you. That's what's in evidence. That's what you have before you. It's up to you as a board to make the determination. And we're just saying that's why my client had no idea he was going to be denied until he came back in with a whole new staff and they said it's not allowed anymore. And that was where my client landed. So I appreciate your time tonight and I'm sorry we went over. Thank you. Thank you. Discussion. Are you going to go forward or next meeting? I right. guess quick discussion. I'm I would say that the, that the county is being very heavy handed and actually, actually fighting it. I mean, it's not a reasonable discussion. They're, just, they're actually fighting it. I think they're being very heavy-handed. I feel it's been going the other, other way. I think the developer or his engineer or his attorney have submitted a plan, but the county has made a determination does not meet the ordinance requirements and does not meet the intent of the comprehensive plan. I mean, I, I, I look at that a little differently. Uh, yeah, I think both of these distinguished attorneys have made very compelling um, arguments, pro and, and con. Um, but if you look at the definition of CZO Chapter 19, it talks about site and it talks about development. And it's unfortunate, I guess, or however you want to look at it, but 
when they submitted their app application, it said Town Creek Development. So their intent was always to develop this as, as a development. And just because you don't like the way the definition reads, you just can't rewrite it because you feel like it doesn't apply to you. So I, it's a tough, it's a tough mm -hmm. situation for everybody right now. To, to me, that's the history of this place has always been a marina. They've always had boats and piers and, and they had the one restaurant kind of going along with that. And I, it's, to me, it still should be zoned as a marina. That's what it always has been until you change it. I don't see how you can go against the rules. And I, I'm, I'm in favor of upholding the director's decision. Well, see, I came in, I came in here tonight with another look at everything because, quite frankly, maybe it's because I was sitting home at the time, but what I heard was essentially the attitude of, of uh, I came in and asked for some guidance, okay? Now, that's kind of changed from what I heard from Ms. Delahaye's question tonight. But, but it sounded like I came in and asked for guidance. You made me put this form on, which you've admitted there is no other form. Um, and then you treated it as, 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 as if it were a real site plan as opposed to just a sketch I have here. And therefore, my attitude was, hey, guys, cancel your letter. Go back to square one and figure out what your alternatives are. And certainly Mr. Knight listed a plethora of alternatives when he was testifying, one of which was the bed and breakfast. Um, but then what tipped me tonight was when Ms. Delahaye basically asked the question, are you pursuing the same thing that you had before? Now, the only thing that bothers me in this is Mr. Shire's letter, basically in the back paragraphs, basically gives him an, gives him an indication that he can build a small footprint residences. So I don't know. It's a toss up here, guys. It's a toss up. Uh, I don't know if somebody just makes a motion and we find out whether it whether we got enough votes and we go the other way. I, uh, Ms. Delahaye, did you think he really understood your question? Yes. It seemed like he was back and forth, couldn't understand. I, I think they understood the question, and I think the intent all along was to, that's the impression I get, it's, you know, what that's worth. Um, they didn't go in there with saying, I mean, the title, development, it's, that's what it was. That well, was the intent all along. But he was, understood but he was also waffling it with, you know, the the last word. Okay. Well, I'm ready uh, to make a motion. Okay. All right, Let's make, make a motion so Amy can get home. Okay. In the matter of ZAP 20-1746 Town Creek Marina, Burkhardt appeal, I make a motion to uphold the director's decision to disapprove the development sketch that did not meet a minimum setback and the base density standards of schedule 32.1 uphold it a second okay vote motion and a second may um Discussion? mr chair may, may i make a suggestion okay and i wonder if the um the motion should specifically say that the board agrees with the interpretation of the word site as uh, set forth in the uh in the uh, director's uh guidance uh, email of uh, let me get the date of it August 10 2020 because that's really the question at hand here the question is uh, the interpretation of the word site as it uh, relates to the CM zone and, and, and also I'll, I'll hold the director's decision of his interpretation what, of the word. Do you want to redo that? Let's start over. No, I'll just add that to it. 
Okay. <laughs> you, may, you make yeah. Mr. Murphy included in his right of vote. Okay. And I'll second his That's addendum. Moved and seconded. Any more discussion? Mr. Richardson. Yes. Mr. Brown. Yeah, yes. It's for voting for the motion. Yes. And the motion is to uphold the directors. To uphold the directors. Yes. 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 Okay. Five zero. Mm -hmm. To uphold the director's decision on the project. Okay, we've got a couple of items real quick. Uh, I hope you all have had a chance to move it. Reading the 60 days thing. Or does he? Oh, yes, 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 I'm sorry. You're right. You're correct. You're correct. <laughs> um, for the applicant appellant um, and their representatives, an order reflecting the board's decision will be prepared by staff and signed by the board within 60 days. 30-day period following from the date of the order is signed, which any aggrieved party may appeal the board's decision to the circuit court. Any action taken at that, that time must be at your own risk. Our recording secretary will mail you a copy of the order when it is signed. Thank you all. Thank you for your time, Mr. Chairman. Have a good evening. You too. Um, Callaway 711, and this was an order to approve variances in the uh, setbacks, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Motion to, to approve. Sign. Yeah, I'm gonna motion to sign the order. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Second one is for the Leonardtown 711 appeal. And uh, it is the final, we finally got the motion, the, the, the orders on that, that denies the 7-Eleven. Now, before we vote, I just, for the record, asking counsel, understanding that we have Mr. Hayden, and he conducted the entire proceedings, but Mr. Andowski will be signing the order. Is there anything out of line by doing that? Uh, no, Mr. Brown, that's perfectly okay. We're... Uh... We're uh, creating an order from a decision that was properly made by this board. So, uh, okay. That's, I just that's wanted no for problem. the record. Okay. Make a motion with sign the order. Second. Second. Aye. 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 Um, then we have a copy of the um, annual report for year 2020. Um, and again, there's a letter for signing to forward this to the county commissioners. Did everybody have a chance to review it? Yes. Yes. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I think we also have the minutes for the last meeting of January 14th. Make a motion. Yes. We approve the minutes. Second. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. Um, anything else for the good of the order? No. That's I just want to thank um, Lynn for sticking me real good a couple weeks ago. <laughs> 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 and uh, it didn't hurt. It did. <laughs> and she was doing a great job. And I really, I mean, the day that we went two weeks ago, I think the temperature was probably 35 or so, and the winds were 20, 35 miles an hour. And she stood out there in the cold and wind, giving out shots and asking people inappropriate questions. <laughs> <laughs> St. Mary's Health Department has done a phenomenal job for St. Mary's County. A shout out to all of them. The process is terrific I mean, as far as the flow and handling it. Yeah, I thought so too. Wonderful. Because I've you. been through it twice. <laughs> Make a motion with adjourn. Second. Amy, you can go home. <laughs> Thank you all for bearing with us and staying yeah. tonight for another 20 minutes. <laughs>